Oh, Tom, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But he said that there's somebody else that's working, but but um, uh, Joiner. Yeah, public. It's it's a public works issue. They have come to, on our street to look into. So I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will up here. I mean, the city said it was the state. The state says, no, Miss Peterson, our highway is to now, and there are people who Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> no, please miss it. Please. Definitely miss it. I did not get my coffee like I thought earlier. Yeah. I'm going to. Do. Good evening. Good evening. Seven o'clock. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, friends. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order at seven o'clock on June the 3rd, 2019. And I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight. We're very glad to have you uh, and uh, very much looking forward to having a good meeting tonight and welcome all of you all. I'd also now like to ask you all to please join me in a moment of silent meditation. <coughs> Thank you. Folks, if you could please come in and take a seat. We've got a lot of seats and we welcome you and Please find one of them. Can everybody please find a seat in the uh, in the audience? Folks, could y'all find a seat? Thank you. <clears throat> Lots of seats. Councilmember Reese, would you please lead us in the pledge to the flag? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, colleagues and members of the public who are here tonight. It's your practice practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Thank you very much, Council Member. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Middleton. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Freeman just walked in and said she's here. Okay. Madam Clerk, thank you. Councilmember, welcome. Uh, we'll now proceed with our ceremonial items, and I'm going to ask Councilmember Alston to please join me uh, at the microphone. We are here tonight uh, 
with our, our uh, one ceremonial item tonight is, is a, a pride proclamation and pride month. And I'm going to uh, ask if they, if they would join us here at the podium. Jay Clapp, the chair of pride. And uh, Helena Craig, if you would also join us up here, uh, the executive director of the LGBTQ Center of Durham. Are you all here? Oh, great. Welcome. Glad to see you. And I'm going to ask uh, Council Member Austin if she would uh, do the honors. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Whereas Durham has distinguished itself as a city where LGBTQ identified people can enjoy a community that reflects their diversity, and whereas thousands of LGBTQ North Carolinians across the state do not live in communities that are intentional about their safety and well being and live in fear and silence as a result. And whereas despite increased visibility and valuable legal recognitions, rates of violence and harassment and bullying remain high for LGBTQ identified people and youth in particular, even in our own city. And whereas Pride Month kicks off a season of celebrating the LGBTQ community and commemorates the beginning of the organized public fight for full equality catalyzed by the Stonewall Riots. And whereas Pride Month 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. And whereas in the 1960s, at the time when LGBTQ lives were more uniformly criminalized and gay culture was op openly condemned, the Stonewall Inn in New York City, like other gay nightclubs across the country, was a safe place to find community and refuge. And whereas on June 28, 1969, police raided the Stonewall Inn, and for six days, LGBTQ advocates, patrons, and supporters of the Stonewall Inn resisted. And whereas Durham hosted the first LGBTQ march in North Carolina on June 27, 1981, and the first annual Pride March in North Carolina. And whereas the fear and oppression that created a need for a place like the Stonewall Inn may not be as apparent in a welcoming city like Durham, there are still many people living in our state who do not have a refuge or a place to find community. And for those folks, our Pride Month celebrations are especially meaningful. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim June 2019 as Pride Month in Durham, and hereby welcome all citizens to join in Pride Month celebrations around the city throughout the month of June, culminating in the Pride, Durham Pride Parade on September 28, 2019. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the third day of June, 2019. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Shul and Councilperson Alston. Truly appreciate all of those words. Um, as the chair of Pride here in Durham, North Carolina, Pride Durham NC, I'm super excited that Durham is taking the stance of declaring June as uh, Pride Month here in the city. As you know, it, this is the 50th anniversary of the riot that was Stonewall, uh, leading to the liberation and freedom and existence of so many folks across this country thus far. Uh, as we look forward to the month of June here in Durham, obviously we have a lot of events that are focused on the lives of queer and trans people of color, but also all folks, uh, including we're obviously doing the Pride Night at the Durham Bulls Athletic Park on Wednesday. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, wait, aren't you throwing out the first pitch? You're throwing out, and where <laughs> Councilperson Alston will be throwing out the first pitch, and there will be a pride flag being given in honor of the LGBTQ Center of Durham, um, up for auction, so please support the LGBTQ Center of Durham. But also, to celebrate 50 years of Stonewall, we will also be having a big event on June 28th. We also have a fundraiser on June 25th uh, with performances by a local queer artist uh, named Juliana Finch, and then also opportunities for free tickets to, not free, not free. <laughs> Fundraisers are not free. Um, to raise funds for the LGBTQ Center of Durham, Sylvanesso has graciously given two tickets to be auctioned off that evening to their concert in November. But we're super excited about what this means for the city of Durham, the fact that we're bringing Pride activities to the month of June, and of course, we look forward to seeing you all in September for the Pride Durham NC Pride March and also festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
And uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing Councilmember Austin throw out that first pitch. <laughs> Have you been working on your arm? <laughs> Always. You got this, Nuke. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. And now I'll ask, are there any announcements by members of the council? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, about a year ago, the city council voted to give you all and all the other residents and students here in Durham the opportunity to decide how to spend $2.4 million of public money through participatory budgeting. And over the last year, we hired our two fabulous PB staff members, Andrew Holland and Robin Baker, and worked with them, our incredible budget director, Bertha Johnson, an entire staff team here in the city, 15 member steering committee, community outreach workers from NIS and our innovation team, and 75 budget delegates to turn those 550 ideas that were generated from our residents into three ballots worth of comprehensive projects with budgets and um, all kinds of information attached. And for the last month, we've all had the opportunity to vote on which of those projects would be funded by the city. And due to the efforts of this incredible team, we exceeded our ambitious goal of 10,000 voters who participated in our first two votes. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who is involved with a special thanks to our PB staff, some of whom are over there. Wave hi, y'all. <laughs> um, and our steering committee and everyone who participated. Um, this has been an incredible opportunity for the city to jump into this kind of direct democratic program, and we're really excited about how everything's turned out. We're going to be spending the next year um, thinking about how the process went this year, evaluating our efforts and our results, and going out into the community and asking folks for feedback on how things went and designing our second year, and also implementing the projects that we voted on this year. So we hope that everyone will continue to be involved in PB for the next year as we uh, figure out how we can make it even greater uh, next time around. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. That's an awesome announcement. I, I was, man. <clears throat> I didn't think we we're going to make that goal, I'll be honest with you, but we did and we exceeded it and I'm super excited. So congratulations to our whole community and especially to our fabulous staff. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, where we could be very proud of this direct democracy uh, that we've done. And uh, I'm excited to be the, see the uh, projects implemented. Uh, council members, any other announcements? Council member Freeman. Thank you. I um, just want to say I apologize for running a little bit late. I um, hadn't seen my kids since last Thursday, and I had to run home for a hug after, mm. <laughs> after a meeting. But um, I just wanted to share that I had the opportunity to, to attend the 2019 Black Millennials Conference, and I learned that I'm a millennial. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, I wanted to share, <laughs> I just wanted to share that um, this evening that there's an upcoming Black Enterprise Forward uh, Conference, formerly the Enterprise Entrepreneurial Summit, that will be held at the Charlotte Convention Center from June 19th to June 22nd. It's a great opportunity for emerging entrepreneurs and small business owners in Durham to learn about a lot about how to start, grow, and sustain a business. Uh, last year, over 1,200 people attended uh, throughout the country, and uh, the four-day event at the Convention Center this year will actually be the 24th annual uh, summit and the third time it's been held in the state of North Carolina. I can't express that enough. Like it's the third time it's been held in the state of North Carolina. This is a actual event that highlights black businesses in a way in which um, it should be highlighted. And um, I wanna make sure that I encourage uh, everyone, especially black women in business, to actually take advantage and uh, use the opportunity to engage with the national media resource being that it's sponsored by Black Enterprise. Uh, black Enterprise is over 40 years old, and the uh, magazine has been geared towards driving black entrepreneurship and uh, has built a multimedia brand, and I just want to make sure that folks know that it's coming up very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any further announcements? If not, I'll ask for priority items. Mr. Manager, any priority items tonight? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Uh, there is one priority item from the City Manager's Office. 
And uh, that is agenda item number 13 on the agenda tonight, the approval of dedicated housing funds to the Community Empowerment Fund to provide services for landlord engagement. We'd ask that uh, this item be referred back to the administration, uh, but I also wanted to advise the council, anticipate that uh, we'll have this as a priority item on Thursday's agenda to uh, take an action. There was a, a minor issue with the, uh, the contract language. Thank you, Mr. Manager. You all have heard the manager's priority item. Can I hear a motion on that? So moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded that we approve the manager's priority item. All in favor, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? <laughs> Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Madam Attorney, uh, any priority items tonight? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. We have no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Good evening, Mayor and Council. I have no items. Thank you so much. We'll now move to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, items can be pulled by the, from the consent agenda by any member of the council or any member of the public, and those items which are pulled are held for discussion at the, until the end of the meeting. Um, these are items which we, the council has previously done a significant amount of work on. I'll begin, uh, thank you, Tonetta. Uh, the, I'll, I'll read the consent agenda items. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, Carolina Theater of Durham Board of Trustees reappointment. Item three, Durham Open Space and Trails Commission reappointments. Item four, Citizens Advisory Committee appointments. Item five, Durham City County Appearance Commission appointment. Item six, Durham Cultural Advisory Board appointments. Item seven, Overtime Performance Audit April 2019. Item eight, amend the 2018-19 budget and other grant and capital project ordinances amendments. Item that item has been pulled from the agenda, item eight, um, and also uh, item nine, racial equity task force initial report. Both of those items have been pulled from the consent agenda. Item 10, approval of interlocal agreement to fund anti-hunger initiative implemented using the city of Durham cities combating hunger through after school and summer meals program, CHAMPS grant funds. Item 11, amendments to the civilian police review board procedure manual. Item 12, Grant Project Ordinance, GPO, FY17, Continuum of Care, COC Planning Grant. Item 13, Approval of Dedicated Housing Funds to the Community Empowerment Fund, CEF, to provide services for landlord engagement. That item has been referred back to the administration and we will, uh, we're anticipating seeing that at our work session on Thursday. Item 14, Durham Housing Authority, J.J. Henderson Tower Development Loan Commitment to Durham Housing Authority Development Ventures, Inc., in an amount not to exceed $2,900,000. Item 15, Rental Assistance Program with Willard Street, LLC. Item 16, Endorsement of Encampment Response Policy. Item 17, Amendment to Part 17-107 Parking Fee Ordinance. Item 18, North Durham Water Reclamation Facility Digester Mixing Improvements. Item 19, Academy Road Water Line. Item 20, Approval to Execute a Memorandum of Agreement for the Western Intake Partnership. Item 21, Southeast Regional Lift Station Amendment Number 2 to the Professional Engineering Services Contract for construction-related services. Item 22, $95 million general obligation bond referendum. Item 23, serious resolution and amended. If we could pull item 22. Under item 22. Uh, item 23, series resolution and amended and restated bond order of the City of Durham, North Carolina, authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $263 million water and sewer utility system revenue bond anticipation note, series 2019. Item 24, bid report, April 2019. Item 25, proposed lease with suites by Shada Company at Morgan Rigsby Garage. Item 26, proposed lease with Candible Inc. at North Carolina Corporation at Morgan Rigsby Garage. Item 27, design services with Horvat Associates at PA for the Chapel Hill Road sidewalk project. Item 28, on-call professional consultants recommendations. Item 29, Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee bylaws. Item 30, fiscal year 2019-20 contract to fund economic development programs and services operated by Downtown Durham, Inc. using City of Durham grant funds. Item 31, fiscal year 2019-20 amendment to contract for city services and programs for the Downtown Durham Municipal Service District. Item 32, professional services contract with Alta Planning and Design for the city's trail implementation program. Item 34, contract WS86D with Horvath Associates PA for professional services for 2018 water and sewer extensions. 
Item 35, contract SD 298, pavement pres preservation 2019 project. Item 36, contract ST 290C, inspections for various city construction projects. Item 50, Durham Economic Justice Resolution. You've now heard the consent agenda, and I'll accept a motion to pass the consent agenda with the exceptions of items 8, 9, 13, and 22. Mr. Mayor, if I could just make a note. Ms. Peterson, um, will you please follow the usual procedure? And Mr. Mayor, just a note on the item 50. Um, it's just a note to say it might be a good idea to note that you support the local progress rather than having it as letterhead in the memo. Council member. Just noting um, for item 50, I don't want to pull it because I want to support it, but I do think it's um, kind of a, um, a gray area to have the local progress as the actual like letterhead as opposed to the city of Durham. Okay, thank you, so noted. All right, uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion to pass the consent agenda with the exception of items eight, nine, 13, 22, 30, and 31. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We pass the consent agenda with the exception of those items. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Thank you very much. Motion passes 7 0. Second. Uh, Colleagues, uh, before we go into the general business agenda public hearings, I want to make sure that staff who, have, uh, who are here uh, to be present for each of these items which, has been pulled, who are, which have been pulled will be able to. We're going to have a long night, and I want to be able to make sure that staff can leave uh, if they don't need to stay for the public hearing items, but just for these items. So with your permission, I'm going to go ahead and hear these items now. Any concerns? Thank you very much. All right, the first item that's been pulled is item eight, Ms. Peterson. Ms. Peterson, you have three minutes. Thank you. One of the reasons why I pulled this item, because if you look at it, there is uh, two grants, two federal grants dealing with law enforcement. And I don't know if our awesome police chief is here who is doing an awesome job here in Durham in spite of the shooting and the murdering that is going on, particularly in the African-American community upon African-Americans. So Mr. Mayor, I would just like to ask, do you know the dollar amount that they have received for the Fortunate Fund Grant Project as well as from the state and I would like to know exactly how, what are their plans for those federal grant monies that we are receiving from the feds as well as from the state. I, I, I may have an idea where the funds are coming from. I don't want to say that because I don't want to make a mistake, but if they are here. Now, I, I want to share this. Durham is in a, is in a crisis. We've got some serious crime going on in this community. It's not just up to the police chief to take a bite out of crime. She cannot do it all by herself. We have a lot of organizations, at least we used to, have some organizations in Durham who also try to help in working with our young men and women who have criminal records and sometimes they feel they cannot get a job so they go back out into the community and they commit crimes. That is not good. That is not good for the African-American community. I'm not trying to be prejudiced. I know that in the white community, they also have some issues also. But I live in the African-American community. I hear the guns going off one and two and three o'clock in the morning. I told this city several years ago, if we do not address the gun problem, the shooting problem in this city. Persons may buy homes, 
but they're not going to want to go through a war zone to get home. So I would like to know what, how does the police department plan to use these dollars and what is the dollar amount? Because I'm hoping that maybe some of these dollars could be used to hire some additional police officers. But that's not the only thing we need to how to attack crime. Some of this, these dollars need to be, needs to go for job training. Some of them needs to be used for, uh, for stipends to help young men and women. When I used to live up north, and I know I'm losing my time here, so if the person could, could answer my two questions or three questions on Mr. Mayor for the police department, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, your time is up. I see one of our uh, budget staff is here. Go ahead. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, Christina Reardon, Budget and Management Services. Uh, the first grant project ordinance is um, number 15320 is in the amount of nine, um, $985,000. And the second grant project ordinance, 15321, is in the amount of $250,000. Um, I um, am with Budget and Management Services. I'll, I'll, I'll answer the other question. Thank you very much, Ms. Reardon. Uh, these are, uh, Generally, these funds are generally used uh, in our police department for all of the various expenditures that a police department normally has for personnel and equipment and other things. Ms. Peterson, thank you very much. Uh, Can I get the dollar amount from the state, please, sir? She gave me, uh, she did not give me the information for the state. Ms. Peterson, from the state. Ms. Peterson, thank you very much. She gave you the answer about this grant ordinance, that, and, and you know that she did. The state of North Carolina Department of Justice, Department of Revenue, that is one of the dollar amounts also that she did not thank, give me that Thank you very much. Do you uh, have that information? Council members, I'm gonna ask for a vote on this motion. Uh, uh, Madam, do you have that information? No. Okay, well that's why I'm asking. She doesn't have it, Mr. Ms. Mayor. Peterson, thank you. Okay. Can I have a motion for this? Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we uh, uh, approve item eight. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. We'll now move to item nine. Ms. Peterson, welcome. You have three minutes. You gotta learn how to work this budget if you want some of your you have to learn how to work this if you want some of your concerns addressed. Madam Clerk. The other concern is that racial equality, listen, lately over the years, I constantly hear that. But I really do not see anyone dressing the black males in this community to help them get employment. It seems like a lot of other groups now have come into Durham and they talk about racial equality. I just want to share with this community what happened to African Americans in this country and in North Carolina. Blatant discrimination because of the color of their skin. Do we remember when blacks could not even get employment in a lot of places? If these organizations, Mr. Mayor, are going to be out here addressing racial equality, please tell us, please tell the, communi the community, how are we helping black men in this community? The young black men that go in and out of McDuka Terrace, the young black men that are in our jails, the young black men and young women that are coming home from the penal system, from the prisons. Most of the city council members now that sit on this council are people of color that look like me, that many of them probably even live in the African-American community. But it's very rarely, very rarely, when I hear them really talk about this. Not Ms. Freeman, Ms. Freeman, you do pretty good. I, I gotta give it to you. I gotta give it to you, sister. I gotta give it to you. But there are others on this council. Now, I'm getting ready to say something. I know I'm going to make some folks mad. 
But we've got to do something to get this crime down in the black community, period. We jump on the bag wagon for all these other groups. We have a lot of other groups who now have come out out of the woodwork. But they weren't slaves for over 200 years in this country. I want to repeat myself. They were not in bondage in this nation for 200 some years. It irritates me when other organizations try to come on the bag wagon of the struggle of the black man and the black woman in this country and particularly in this community. I'm tired of it and the mess needs to stop. When your mothers and fathers were lynched in this country and lynched in this state, then you can come out and talk about all the problems that you have experienced. Stop it coming on the bag wagon of black folks and our struggle. Our struggle is separate and different. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. I'll now accept a move to receive the initial report from our fabulous Racial Equity Task Force. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 22. Councilmember Freeman. Yes, thank you. I um, expressed um, some concerns around the tension of setting up a housing bond uh, a number of times. I just want to make sure I reiterate that I'm, I'm not supporting it moving forward at this time, recognizing that there is a, um, a lot of gray area and making sure that we're not creating a subsidization of gentrification and revitalizing low-income communities only without a comprehensive plan that actually includes a racial impact analysis. Um, I want to also note that there are some, I also have concerns around how the rail has ended and we haven't yet figured that part out. And so making sure the alignments of all of our comp plans are, are moving together, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing again that concern. I want to also note that the tension is not just in the planning, it's also in the taxing and noting that just as uh, Ms. Peterson noted, uh, the, the experience for black people in this country has been very different for other than for others. And if we compound uh, new, race neutral policies in place without acknowledging those differences, we're gonna continue to compound the effects of racism. And I just wanna note that for the public because I don't support moving forward right now. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, there'll be a lot of more discussion about the housing bond. We've had a lot, and we'll have a lot more, but thank you so much for your comment. Madam Clerk. Uh, Move to adopt the resolution, Mr. Mayor. Second. Thank you. Been moved and seconded that we adopt the resolution uh, to introduce the bond order authorizing the issuance of $95 million general obligation housing bonds and uh, to set a uh, public hearing on the bond order for June 17th, 2019. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Thank you so much. The motion passes 6-1 with Council Member Freeman voting now. Thank you. Um, now we'll move to item 30. Ms. Peterson, you have two minutes. Ms. Ms. Peterson, we're glad to have you, and you have two minutes. Okay, but I'm losing a minute. I'm in unless the city council votes to change the, the amount of time I have, Mr. Mayor, I'm supposed to have my three minutes. But, but that's okay. Yes, they're not allowed just to change it. We are we're entitled to three minutes. If they want to change it, the whole council has to vote on it. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. You're, you're using your time. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'm trying to be honest, and you need to be honest here, too. But let me just share this with you. I have a little concern. Can somebody please tell me why um, this organization is still getting monies for the city, the 170 some thousand dollars and what, what do they plan to do, and how many African Americans do they have on staff now? 
Ms. Peterson, go ahead, finish your comments, and then if there are any questions well, that staff can answer, we'll go ahead and answer them. Okay, okay, well, do they have a representative here, this organization? And I would like to know how many, how many African Americans do they have on their, on their staff now, as well as what is their plan to, to use the hundred and seventy some thousand dollars for it just says one hundred and seventy some thousand, Mr. Mayor. Are those your comments, Ms. Peterson? Yes. Thank you very much. But I still have a minute left, so I will go like ahead and finish minute. your comments, Ms. Peterson. And after you're finished, we'll get you the answers if we have them. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm finished, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Ms. Peterson. The uh, attachment in the agenda item has the agreement that outlines all of the uh, work that will be performed for this this uh, contract. Okay, can you please tell me, because I didn't see anything in there that states how many African Americans are working for the I, company. I can tell you that. Uh, the organization is a small organization. I know that the executive director is African American. I believe that they have four employees, and uh, at least two of them are African American, in addition to which uh, they run the ambassadors program, and uh, the, the great majority of the ambassadors are African American. Uh, I think probably about 11 out of 12. Okay, well, next time we really need to make sure, Mr. Mayor, not that what you believe, because we all can believe a whole lot of things until we really find out in reality what really truth is. So let's try to make sure when they give their report that it's in there. Not, I, we, we've got to stop going on, I believe, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Our Ms. Young Peterson. Our men in this community needs jobs. We're giving them my, our tax dollars, and we need to make sure that they are being employed. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, there's been, uh, uh, can I have a motion that Mayor. we approve the uh, contract to fund the economic development programs and services? I believe. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor, can Thank I just you. have one comment briefly? As the sure. chair of the Council Procedures Committee, I wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience, as well as the members of the Council, were aware about the rules about speaking time. Um, contrary to Ms. Peterson's uh, statement, uh, the mayor does have the authority under our rules to um, apportion time among speakers. Uh, the mayor may reduce the time allocated to an individual person. The Council may, by majority vote, contradict the mayor and That's extend right. or limit time. But, the, That's right. but as the presiding officer of our meeting, the mayor does have the authority to do that, Ms. Peter. Well, then you guys Thanks, must, Mr. Mayor. must have tweeted, but still the council is supposed to, can also vote on it. But that's, that's okay. You, that's correct. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. And, and that's all I wanted to say, that the, the mayor really cannot just do that. We now have phone. item 31. Ms. Peterson, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, sir. Now it looks like here we have another organization that wants to get a little bit over a million dollars. Am I correct? Do they have a spokesperson here, Mr. Mayor? Ms. Peterson, please make your remarks. And once you have made your remarks, we'll try to answer all of your questions. Well, I just want to share, Mr. Mayor, also, is that we pay these folks to come to work. This council meeting is part of their job. They are being paid. They should be here to answer our questions. So here's my question. How many African Americans will be used that they're planning to use to help work and share, which is well over a million dollars, Mr. Mayor. And that person, I'm hoping they're here, that they can share with us also what is some of the plans for well over a million dollars that they're asking. They're asking the taxpayers to constantly give the same organizations monies year in and year out. But we can't even have somebody really to come and really share with us what is going on. Something is wrong, Mr. Mayor, because if we're helping all these kids, then we should not be having all this crime going on in this community. If we're giving them jobs, if we're helping them get employment, if they're getting training, then why is it that we have so much crime going on in this city? And the city council members, you folks should ask the same question. All this tax dollars going to these different groups. So, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if you have anyone here, here this evening that could share with the taxpayers how the million dollars is also going to be spent for this organization. It really would be good. And also to tell us how many African Americans will be sharing, will be getting some of these dollars, Mr. Mayor. Are those your comments, Ms. Peterson? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, this is the same organization as in the last item, mm -hmm. so the figures are the same. Thank you so much. All right. 
I will now uh, ask council members for a motion on item 31. So moved. Approval. Second. And moved and seconded that we approve the amendment to the contract for city services and programs. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Thank you. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor, if I could make a comment. Sure. I just want to note that um, in the attachments on page two and three, there are actual numbers that gives a breakdown for the million dollars. And I want you to note that in economic development, there is 121,500 um, and also uh, 715,000 that's really geared towards clean and safe, which is our actual ambassador program that the mayor mentioned, which has four, four or seven, I think there's a number of African-American employees actually. And then also noting that um, the organization has taken a previous council member, uh, Cora Cole McFadden's, um, I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem, former Mayor Pro Tem Cora Cole McFadden's advice around making sure that they target black and brown um, entrepreneurs being downtown and they've been working really hard to make sure that they have them included and have actually pushed for a number to open up. So you, I'm not sure if you're aware of Zen Succulent and Jetta's Tea, but those are both two African-American women who are opening up downtown shops, forward-facing retail locations that will be um, available this summer. So I just want you to note that that has been addressed. I didn't want you to leave tonight thinking that it wasn't. Thank you, council member. I believe we have now disposed of all the items pulled from the consent agenda. Um, normally we hold those till the end of the meeting, but uh, tonight I know we're gonna have a long meeting and I wanna make sure that staff who have to be here for that can go home if they need to. All righty, uh, we'll now move to our general business agenda, public hearings, and the first item is item 40, FY 2019 and 20 budget an FY 20 to 25 capital improvement plan, CIP. Um, we have forty-one speakers to this item. Oh, apparently we have more. Looks like we have at least 46 speakers. So I'm going to ask each speaker to please hold your comments to two minutes. 46 speakers tonight. Uh, and I'm going to call uh, groups of speakers. And as I call you, if you could please line up over here to the right, that would be great. Just want to say we're really glad to have you tonight. These budget public hearings are really important. And we're really glad that so many people have come out to make your voices heard. Uh, we've also heard from a lot of people on the budget, as we always do every year, through emails and social media and other speakers at other meetings. So welcome. We're really glad to have you, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, we'll start out. Uh, our first speaker is Allison Shauger. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, I forgot that important thing. Uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask our budget director. Bertha Johnson to please introduce the item. Apologies, Bertha. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Uh, Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. This is a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed 2019-20 budget, 2025 capital improvement plan. The item has been published in the local newspaper as required by general statutes. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Budget Director Johnson? Thank you. We'll now uh, declare the public hearing open. And uh, Ms. Shogger, welcome. I'm going to call a, a couple of other people before you uh, get started. Uh, if you all could join Ms. Shogger over to the right. Second is John Morris, George Vaughn, Dave Conley, and Hart Pillow. If you all could please join Ms. Shogger. Ms. Shogger, welcome. Uh, please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. All right. Allison Shager, 1528 North Duke Street. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this year's budget. 
In 2017, Council adopted a Vision Zero resolution representing a commitment to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries on our streets. The city's strategic plan has a goal of creating a safer community together. One of the initiatives within that goal is to create a Vision Zero action plan and deliver speed management projects. I'm pleased to see the Transportation Department has plans to complete and circulate a data-driven Vision Zero action plan in this fiscal year. As we prepare for a new Director of Transportation to begin in the near future, it's essential that this budget serve as a guide for the work that needs to be done which is to create a Vision Zero action plan that lays out concrete projects with annual milestones and KPIs on all modes of transportation and invites transparent assessment. The City's Transportation Department performance summary on pages 269 to 271 shows several objectives, but KPIs specifically around increased protected bike lane infrastructure, increasing ridership and safety for cyclists are lacking. The objective addressing multimodal transportation options has KPIs that relate exclusively to transit. The objective that addresses Vision Zero lists three programs, two of them measure street lighting. There are KPIs related to sidewalks, but measurable goals around miles of protected bike lanes created, bike-related bike crashes, and ridership are sorely missing. On behalf of Bike Durham, I implore you to add more specific Vision Zero indicators into this year's budget to include measurement and assessment of all modes of transportation. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a quick question of this resident before they go? Can you tell the council what a KPI is? Key performance indicators, measurable goals. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Shogger, let me just say that between now and June the 17th, which is when our budget will occur, I'm sure we won't be adding these performance indicators in because these are things that staff will do. But this is an ongoing project, and I want to suggest that you please make, uh, you and folks in Bike Durham make a detailed recommendation uh, on that, and I'm sure that staff will take it very seriously. And as you say, we are looking forward to our new transportation director as well. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll have John Morris. John Morris, 3 Quinton Place. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Durham City Workers UE150 speaking in support of raising all part-time city employees to a $15 per hour livable wage and to push back against the hiring of more police officers and stand with Durham Beyond Policing's proposal. I wanted to thank the residents of Durham whose taxes recently raised our full-time city workers pay. Unfortunately, this resulted in the creation of a class system as our part-time workers were overlooked and left behind as if their contributions to the city were somehow less than. I work hard to provide clean drinking water to Durham's residents, its hospitals, its universities, and commercial businesses, and I still can't stand here and say that I work harder than the part-time city workers you employ. More often than not, these part-time workers are going to school and working two or three jobs just to get by. The average cost of rent in Durham per the 2017 U.S. Census Bureau report is $998 per month. Your part-time city worker making $12 an hour comes in under $100 shy of meeting their monthly rent. They've still got to pay for their schooling, medical and dental costs, their car if they can even afford one, and uh, electricity, local transportation, internet, water, sewer, groceries, and phone just to stay connected and employed within this modern world. We don't need to flood the streets with more police officers. We need systemic grassroots change within the communities and from the ground up. I ask our council to reread and review the Durham Beyond Policing proposal <laughs> and to improve the survivability of your part-time city workers with a livable wage. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Vaughn, Mr. George Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, thank you. Welcome, you have two minutes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is George Vaughn. I live at 1022 Westwood Drive here in Durham. On August 1st, 2018, the JCCPC voted to prioritize the historic Forest Hills NPO application. Uh, and as a result of that, 
we had to go through, we had gone through a process where 64% of the property owners in Forest Hills had signed a petition within a four week period. And this is our indicator of how strong the interest is in our neighborhood in having this neighborhood protective overlay. And we've got some of our neighbors here tonight if they would wave their hands. Um, and the planning department has asked and put in the budget a request for funds to hire a consultant to move this project forward. And we need to get it done in the physical year 1920 or we lose our application and we'll have to go through the process again. And I would like to quote Patrick Young at the old West Durham NPO council meeting. Regarding our, in position, our position on the NPO, the planning department, this is really the only tool, the only citizen-led tool in the unified development ordinance that is a citizen-led process and we are very respectful of that. So we would like to see you follow through on funding this item so that we can continue with protecting our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaughn. Uh, now we hear from Dave Conley. Mr. Conley, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Dave Connolly, Three Bland Spring Place in Durham County, and I'm Chair of DOS, the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission. To protect Durham's investment in existing trails, DPR staff has identified $3.2 million in repair and maintenance needs. We ask Council to fund this maintenance backlog. Second, to ensure that future plant trails are planned equitably, we ask to put staff in place in Neighborhood Improvement Services, or NIS, who are assigned to advance equitable community engagement specifically for trail developments. Uh, we ask to budget, continue to budget $2 million a year to see the creation of Durham's nine priority new trails, maximizing our opportunities to succeed in winning uh, federal sources of funding. And lastly, uh, thank you for funding the feasibility study known as the Trail Implementation Program in item 32. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Connolly. We'll now hear from Hart Pillow. Welcome. Uh, you have two minutes. Good evening. I appreciate all of the effort that has gone into creating the 2019-2020 budget for the City of Durham. I'm happy to participate in the final edition of this budget by asking you to consider this important addition. We need to create a position and fill that position for a full-time person to educate us to reduce, reuse, recycle our stuff. I returned to Durham a year ago and moved into a neighborhood that has a designated area for recycling. I drive into the area, take my items out of the car, and place them into one of the 25 blue containers. The containers are usually brimming over with recyclables. It is obvious to me that my neighbors and I want to recycle, but we don't know how and we don't know what. I have seen plastic grocery bags, flimsy plastic, glass, cardboard too large for the containers. A neighbor told me this week that she saw a vacuum cleaner in the recyclables. We formed a recycling committee and invited a city employee to present us with an up-to-date picture of how Durham recycles. We brought in items that we were unsure about and asked, can this be recycled? Many of our questions were answered. We found out about the changing markets for recyclables. For example, China no longer is willing to take ours because it is not recycled properly, it is not clean. We learned that present... Thank you, Ms. Pillow. Oh, oh. okay, well, this, you'll get this in print. Would you, uh, if you have that, and you could give that to the clerk, we read everything we get, and we usually memorize it. So thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you being here very much. Um, 
I realize I, I should say um, we are adding a, we're doing a lot of uh, new recycling initiatives in this budget and uh, including uh, or, or, uh, organics recycling. Uh, we will be beginning to recycle food waste, uh, hopefully during this year, uh, for the first time in Durham, and it's very unusual in this country. Uh, for the first time in a long time, we're actually losing money on recycling, cycling for the reason you say, uh, uh, but we know how important it is to continue to do it, and it is it continues to be in the budget, and we're taking with many new recycling initiatives in this budget. I also say, in terms of the last speaker, Mr. Connolly, that we are we do have uh, neighborhood improvement staff equitable engagement staff in this budget, <clears throat> in addition to which is $125,000 for equitable engagement along trails uh, and, and other, uh, other city uh, infrastructure uh, that can be, that will be, uh, is budgeted for use by community groups uh, and individuals who live in communities to help assist with that equitable engagement plan. Uh, we'll now hear, if I'll, I'll ask another five folks if they could please come over here. Mr. Chris Tiffany, Sheila Huggins, Ron Baron, John Rooks Jr., and Rob Belcher. If you all could please uh, make your way over here and uh, please give me give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Uh, Chris Tiffany, uh, PO Box uh, 25331. We do not need more police. We do need better police. And segregated light rail for the gentry is dead. Long live public transportation for all members of the public. Over $100 million have been wasted on segregated light rail for the gentry who do not want to ride the bus with, with service workers who stand and wait for them. But if you put up more bus benches for people who have to stand and wait for the bus, then maybe some of the gentry might ride the bus. You want public transportation? Ride the bus and improve maintenance and service. Be safe, reliable, and considerate, and extend the Racial Equity Task Force for at least another year. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. Ms. Huggins. Sheila Huggins, 2408 Tampa Avenue. I speak tonight as chair of and on behalf of the Friends of Durham in support of the police department budget request. In 2016, IACP submitted its report on the, on the department's operations. Although the report made over 40 recommendations, it summarized that the department was generally efficient, well organized, with a strong commitment to community policing and collaborative problem solving efforts. But among those recommendations was one that goes to the heart of the department's current request. The study supported adding personnel to the department. This is not to suggest that the addition of personnel will automatically result in a significant reduction of crime, but it helps. And moreover, it speaks to some of the operational and management needs that are directly impacted by having adequate staffing levels, such as better patrol schedules and more positive opportunities for community engagement. The most recent ICP report continues to support the addition of sworn and non-sworn personnel. The report cites upward population growth from 2006 through 2016 while departmental FTEs remained rel relatively stagnant. This growth has continued since that time and is expected to reach over 280,000 by 2020. That is a 24% increase. It is important to note that funding alone is not the answer. And although our police department builds relationships through programs such as Police Reads, Safe Space, and National Night Out, we know that we must also support our community organizations and our residents who are working daily on the root causes of crime, such as poverty, racial inequity, and reduced economic opportunities. The Friends of Durham ask that you support the funding request, consider purchasing Shot Spotter, and more ways to collaborate with our community partners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Huggins. Mr. Baron, welcome. Good evening. Uh, Lanbar on 208 North Driver Street, Old East Durham. I want to talk about tonight about two numbers, 300,000 and 9,000. 300,000 is the population our dear city is approaching now. 300,000 is the cost to hire six new police officers. 9,000 is the number of people evicted from their homes in our city last year. 300,000 is the cost of doubling the number of people facing eviction to whom legal aid can provide counsel. 
All over the country, data has provided solid evidence that having representation hugely decreases the chance of eviction being carried out. So much so that New York City is now investing millions in the Right to Counsel program, ensuring every person facing eviction has representation. Philadelphia is about to do the same. I call this an investment because it will save New York far, far, far more than it costs. Keeping people in secure homes is by far the most cost-effective way to keep our communities safe, far more so than hiring any new police officers. I understand that there are two barriers to giving legal aid the money they need in this budget. First, the notion that counties should provide the money. Balancing this obligation to county commissioners runs the risk of it, being, of it not being funded at all. This council should stand up to its progressive credentials by not evading this responsibility. The notion that, second, the notion that legal aid must wait for its annual review to get more money. We have dozens of people evicted each and every day, substantial numbers in the neighborhood I live in. We do not have time, but we do have evidence. Eviction diversion works. We have an eviction crisis in Durham. We do not have time to wait. Fund legal aid fully now. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Mr. Rooks. Mr. Rooks, welcome. You have two minutes. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Um, first, I definitely want to be clear that I'm only speaking on behalf of the HRC, the Human Relations Commission, not as myself. I will actually be providing an email to all of you uh, as my own personal comments, okay? Um, so the HRC uh, voted to recommend to the City Council that it support the budget request for Neighborhood Improvement Services for the hiring of, of a Community Engagement Coordinator and for $100,000 in grants to community groups in support of this work. The HRC also voted to recommend to the City Council that no additional budget is allocated for additional police officers this year and to develop appropriately fund a task force to study alternatives to community safety. Also, as we have continued to receive information about ongoing evictions crisis in, in our community, we continue to affirm the recommendations we made last year in support of financial assistance to eviction, eviction diversion program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkes. Mr. Belcher, Mr. Belcher, welcome. You have two minutes. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Belcher, uh, 4328 Chimney Stone Road. I'm with the organization A Chance to Change. Uh, my reason for being here today is pretty much talking about the uh, officers, the, the budget for the officers. I am for more officers. I'm also for, uh, I just, just recently met a group coming here tonight that uh, that not totally against more officers, they feel like they can actually do boots on the ground. So I'm willing to work with anybody in any group that feel like we can come together and be a part of the solution and take care of this problem that we have. Uh, I'm, so I'm not against the uh, policemen. If we, if we definitely, if we have something that we can put together, then I suggest we do it. If we have the money to get the cops, let's get the cops. They're, they're trained to do that. I think there should be training uh, as far as the, how they deal with people. Uh, it should be a training for that. Uh, you do run across that occasional policeman that's not you know, the marquee policeman that you're, you, know, you wanna run into. I know myself, I ran into a few of them. And uh, it's, we do need to have an equity training. Uh, and if, again, Anyone that wants to be boots on the ground, you know, you don't have to be from the hood to go to the hood to talk to the hood. You don't have to. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely not, but I've, I've, I got my stripes. I'm not proud of everything I did, but I'm proud of what I'm doing now. So anybody that wants to get together and you're serious about what you want to do and we want to stop this violence, not curb the violence, we want to stop it, talk to me. I'm from A Chance to Change. We have a mayor that's willing to work with all of us. So let's, let's get it done. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Belcher. Um, I'm now going to call five more names, and if you could come over here to the right, that would be great. Ellen Pless, Laura Stroud, Victoria Peterson, Jim Sfara, and Camilla Faust. <clears throat> Ms. Pless, welcome. You have two minutes. Please give us your name and address. Thank you, yes, good evening. My name is Ellen Pless and I live at 706 East Forest Hills Boulevard. I am here to ask that City Council favorably consider the Planning Department's request for funds to hire, sorry, 
I ran up here, uh, for funds to hire a consultant to work on the Forest Hills Neighborhood Protection Overlay. That funding will allow the planning department to include a line item in their work program. On its website, Durham's planning department states, quote, the National Register is the nation's official list of historic buildings, districts, archaeological sites, and other resources worthy of preservation. Webster's Dictionary defines preservation as the activity or process of keeping something valued, alive, intact, or free from damage or decay. The Comprehensive Plan, Chapter 5, Section 1, quote, provides for the identification, protection, and promotion of historic resources. Yet Durham's national historic districts are not currently protected under its UDO, even though North Carolina Session Law 2015-86 empowers it to do so. A historic property located within one of Durham's national historic districts currently receives no delay or unique consideration when a demolition permit is requested, and it can be torn down the day after that permit is issued. We, from our community, are hopeful that Forest Hills will continue into the future, and we are willing to roll up our sleeves and work toward that end. A spirit of stewardship and thoughtful growth has informed our NPO process thus far. Mindful and forward-looking sensitivity to Durham's needs led Forest Hills residents to submit an NPO application supporting the adoption of locally expanded ADU guidelines. Our city is known for the retention of its historic flavor and its mature trees. I ask that you please support an environmentally conscious historic community availing itself of the only citizen-led tool available under the Unified Development Ordinance. Thank you. Ms. Pless, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Laura Stroud. Ms. Stroud, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Laura Stroud. I'm at Rose Hill Avenue in Old West Durham. Um, I am a member of the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission, speaking as myself this evening. Um, at, as you addressed Dave Connolly's comments earlier, um, I would like to reiterate a few of those points. Um, to, in support of the $3.2 million currently budgeted to um, address existing um, needs, needed repairs along um, Durham's existing trail um, infrastructure. This will go to making sure that our current trail system is um, up to a standard of safety and usability for all users, including walk walkers, um, cyclists, and um, folks who um, have mobility challenges. Um, the second item is to um, for the in support of budgeting 350,000 annually for ongoing maintenance after this um, large investment in any needed updates that currently exist. Um, and also, I'd like to speak in support of the funds for addressing community-rooted partnerships for equitable community engagement um, and speak in support of the work that is currently ongoing to um, allocate staff, uh, staff time and efforts to that, um, that process as well. Um, so thank you all for your ongoing support of trails, and we are encouraged to see um, the financial and staff support allocated to trail infrastructure upgrades, as well as the um, essential need for equitable community engagement as Durham um, continues to expand existing trails um, and any future uh, trail projects. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stroud. Um, Ms. Peterson, welcome. You have two minutes. Minute, Mr. Mayor. But anyway, y'all need your extra minute. Okay, City Council folks. And I want people out here to know this also. Mr. Reeds, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Austin, and the mayor. They are all up for re-election. No. No. Who's that? Who? No, I didn't say her. Yeah. You oh, okay, Miss. Okay, Miss Peterson, your, your two but minutes anyway, are running. Anyway, the point I want to make here, y'all are very upset about how the monies are spent. You want the police department to get money. You want another group not to get money. Then we need to change the house. Sometimes there's nothing wrong in bringing in some new people. All y'all sitting out there, how come some of y'all can't stand up to the plate and run for office? Hmm. I think we need to stop coming in and complaining and you don't want to do the work. 
these people are also trying to do the work, but we do need for them to know that we want some more police officers. The problem in this community is they have an overturn. We, and I know some of y'all are upset about it, but the other problem, we need job training. And every project that this city signs off on, the, they should be made to hire Durham folks, Durham young people. AT&T is laying fiber in Durham. How many black men do you see out there on those streets laying fiber? They've been in my community for weeks. I ain't seen not one brother. Don't we have any black men in this community that need jobs? There's nothing wrong with other folks being hired, but they need to hire some black folks, some young black men to get these kids off these streets. And we need a vocational school. Durham Tech used to be the vocational school. Now it's a two-year college. All these young folks going to college and walking out of college with a $40,000 college. Teach them brick masonry, heating and air conditioning, copper cable and fiber optic, and help them to get a job paying $75 an hour laying bricks. That's Thank what we need to do, Mr. Thank Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Mr. Svar. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. You're welcome, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Svar, I welcome. You have two minutes. Good evening. My name is Jim Savara, 1114 Woodburn Road. I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and, Tra and Transit to encourage you to continue, continue, expand tax relief for low-income homeowners. The city should honor its commitment to fund the third year of the Longtime Homeowners Grant Program to offset tax increases in Southside, Southwest Central Durham, and Northeast Central Durham, resulting from the reappraisal of properties in 2016. There is also a pressing need to expand property tax release efforts as a core strategy to stabilize neighborhoods and offset the effects of gentrification. In the recent reappraisal, residential property values have risen again, especially high in areas where housing costs traditionally were low. The new approach we are considering, along with the People's Alliance, would include the county. We are discussing a local version of the state's circuit breaker approach that permits a deferred tax payment for the amount that exceeds a limit based on income. Like the state program, the homeowner would pay only the last three deferred tax amounts when they sell their house. We need to allow all low-income families citywide and countywide, not just the elderly, veterans, or handicapped, to get relief, relief from excessive taxes. Uh, additional next speakers will discuss why tax relief is so important. We will be talking to you soon about approving this new program in August uh, to provide relief in tax payments for the current tax year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Camilla Faust. I don't see Camilla. All right. Uh, We'll move on to our next group of speakers. If you could line up over here to my right, uh, Vanessa Evans, Catherine Plough, Leslie Nidick, Sherry Starks. The clerk, please. Yeah. Sherry Starks, and Katie M Mongola. Katie, I'm sorry. I know I didn't get your name right. I apologize. When you get up here, you can help me with it. Okay, I apologize. Um, Ms. Evans, welcome. Uh, you, uh, please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. Good evening, Mayor, as well as the City Council. My name is Vanessa Evans. I stay at 3223 Dearborn Drive, Durham, North Carolina. The, Bla the Bradtown community has concerns of the property taxes increases and the gentrification that is happening in Durham. Most people in this area live in poverty, are low income, fixed income, and deal with many health issues. Residents have concerns of how far will gentrification come into Brad, the Bradtown area and not being pushed out because of the high-priced houses. There needs to be a balance for fair housing for all people, not just the rich. I am also a person that lives within the um, Bradtown community that lives on a low income. We are in hopes that the city of Durham will stay open-minded to the needs of all the residents that live in the city and county areas. Residents of Bradtown would like to see the city and assist the residents 
in its taxes and in home improvements. They feel they have been, they feel they put into the city, but do not get back from the city. Our hopes are this, the city of Durham will be the footprint for all residents of the city where you have, where you, you, have, you have everyone who is a have and that they're not the have nots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. <laughs> Catherine Pyle, welcome. Good evening and thank you for your time tonight. I'm Catherine Pyle from Families Moving Forward, 300 North Queen Street. At FMF, typically over 70% of the families experiencing homelessness have an eviction on their record. For most, that eviction either directly caused their homelessness or it started a chain of events leading to needing shelter services. We as a community must work throughout our end-to-end -end system to stem the flow of families being forced into an experience of homelessness. Simply said, keeping people in their homes keeps them from needing a shelter. The eviction diversion program has demonstrated great success in mitigating the eviction process, providing legal representation to those who would otherwise not be able to afford it, and when necessary, negotiating move outs with a timeline that allows for a family to seek other options. But we need greater capacity to serve more households at, ris at risk of eviction. So we at Families Moving Forward support additional funds to be used to expand this really important work. Secondly, I also want to talk briefly about affordable housing. We know that even families that don't have an eviction on the record um, sometimes find themselves in crisis for no other reason than the amount of money they earn. We all know that finding market rate housing that is affordable for a single mom with, of two who's working one or even two low income jobs, low paying jobs is almost impossible. And it's just gonna continue to get worse over the next five to 10 years. When discussing future affordable housing, we as a community must be very intentional about including households at or below 30% AMI. We understand that guaranteeing affordable units for singles and families of extremely low income is expensive, but we have to find a way to provide not only what's in the current DHA plan, but net new units for residents below 30% AMI. Prioritizing an increase of units for this group must be part of the plan for future development if we're ever gonna put a dent in the affordable housing need for the various, very lowest income households in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plow. I will now hear from Leslie Nodick. Ms. Nodick, welcome. You have two minutes. Okay. My name is Leslie Nidick. I live at 1721 Rosetta Drive. I am speaking on behalf of the Board of the People's Alliance. We have 1,700 members we represent in favor of doubling the budget for the eviction diversion program. I won't echo everything that everybody else has said other than uh, as an attorney, we know uh, studies have shown that families who have an attorney or individuals do much better uh, retaining their homes in our city in the first quarter of this program in 2019, 73% of the families who were represented with an attorney uh, did not get evicted. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cede the rest of my time if I'm allowed, and if I'm no, not. I'm sorry, Ms. Nadia. And I will just stop time. and say uh, there are many success stories, and uh, Sherry will speak uh, about a personal story. Uh, but we support this program doubling the funding to 500,000. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Ms. Starks, welcome. You have two minutes. My name is Sherry Starks, and I'm here tonight to talk about doubling the funding for legal aid. I am one of the success stories where um, I was in a home, had been there for 10 years. I was not evicted because of non-payment of rent. I was evicted because of uh, my neighborhood changing and my landlord would be able to get more rent than what I was currently um, paying. He could double the rent. And I just want to say how overwhelming it was um, because I'm a giver and a carer of people that I had to be in that situation. And had it not been for my attorney with legal aid, I probably would not be in success story today. I also want to say that even though we were successful, I yet still have an eviction on my record. And that's maybe another area we need to look at about how you get that off even when you win, yet that record is still there. And I think um, there needs to be something done about that because in the future, if I want to win again, they check that and they can see that. And so now I'm kind of marked 
even when there was a success story. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Stokes. Thank you. Friends, could I just, a little applause is good, but if you maybe just kind of short and we can move it along. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Ms. Bagangolwa, how did I do? Um, I'm Katie Ungongolwa, and I'm here in my capacity with the People's Alliance Racial Equity Action Team. We really want to amplify uh, community voices saying no to expanding the police force and yes to investing in our communities. We believe in a Durham where people can live free from fear. Therefore, we advocate expanding and supporting the social safety net instead of funding additional police officers. We support Durham Beyond Policing's proposals, including the suggestion of a community-led safety and wellness task force. We hope that the City Council invests in visionary solutions that make a positive difference in all people's lives rather than expanding policing and incarceration. And speaking of visionary solutions, we also want to support programs working towards a Durham where no one is left behind. The People's Alliance Racial Equity Action Team wants to make sure that Deer and Welcome Home stays in the budget, and we emphasize funding peer support specialized, uh, specialists full-time for Welcome Home. Additionally, we advocate for fighting the housing crisis by keeping people in their homes. Therefore, we support increasing the budget for the eviction diversion program to $500,000 to double households served to 950. We appreciate your listening to these suggestions and we're excited at the prospect of re-envisioning public safety to a future that includes developing alternatives to the current policing practices. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mangongola. I, I, I want to just stop here in the middle for a minute and appreciate everybody who's speaking tonight. I want you to know that uh, we're all listening to the things that you have to say very seriously uh, about the part-time employee pay, about the police budget, about shot spotter, about eviction diversion, about the equitable engagement, trail maintenance, tax relief for long-term homeowners, the DEER program, Welcome Home program, and others. Many of these things are already in the budget. You should know that, uh, and uh, you're probably aware of that. Uh, but many of them are still things that we're discussing and are looking forward to that discussion of amongst us, ourselves, as the council over the next couple of weeks. But I want you to know that uh, your, your, your words inform our discussion, and we're very grateful for you being here. Uh, I'm going to ask another uh, five people, if they would please come over to my right, uh, Jackie Wagstaff, James Nishimura. <coughs> Scott Harmon, Dick Hales, and Ideal Ortiz. If you all would please uh, come to my right, uh, and uh, you each have two minutes. Uh, Ms. Wagstaff, welcome. You have two minutes. Okay. Mr. Mayor, uh, city council members, um, let me start off by saying that I appreciate you, Councilman Freeman, for your stand on the bond referendum. Uh, Councilman Middleton, I never thought I'd say this, but I appreciate your words from last Wednesday when you actually gave this council a tongue lashing and so eloquently did it. I think what you said was important because there are some ideas and some ideologies that are being used up here, and it's not conducive to being a public servant. And one of the things is people need to understand what a public servant's duties are once you take that oath to become a public servant. And even though there are a lot of things I would agree with tonight with a lot of the speakers, I agree with the eviction diversion program, adding more money to that, because if you show me somebody without a home, I show you somebody going to commit a crime. See it all day long. Um, I believe that you should put more money towards the uh, low-income tax breaks for our low-income residents and our seniors, especially our seniors. I know it was recommended to take out this year because it wasn't being utilized. And I remember you asked the question, had they promoted it a lot? Well, I don't think that happened, but those are some of the things. But I do not sit here and say that I will support not adding additional manpower to the police department. There's no reason why we should not be able to live with both. I think there are some great ideas in this room. I think people have some great ideas. We've been had ideas. I've been looking at budgets since 1998. I've sat through eight of them formally and I informally the rest. I look at them. I know what wasteful spending is. I could tell you where it's at. 
But I do believe that, unfortunately, when we have council members that don't have the will to do their job for fear of not getting the support from people that may not vote for them, it is not fair to the total community. There are other people in this community that do not believe what we're hearing tonight, all of this about no police. We need some, because for me, when I call 911, I'm not going to call Spirit House. I'm not going to call any of these groups. I'm going to call 911. Thank you, Ms. Wagstaff. <laughs> Mr. 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 Mayor, if I could just. Sure. I just want to thank um, former council member Jackie Wagstaff for standing up and welcome her in the chamber. I know we normally at least try to acknowledge. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Council member. Thank you, council member. Uh, Mr. James Nishimura, welcome. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, James Nishimura, 16 Sweet Bay Court. Um, so I live near where the Warren Creek Trail ends on Horton Road, and today I was reviewing some old plans, and I had recalled that it was planned to extend all the way to the West Point on the Eno, and I found it in the 2011 Durham Trails and Green Greenway plan. Mind you, that's eight years ago. And um, that plan cited a 1988 plan that proposed having the North-South Greenway extend all the way from I-40 all the way to West Point. So that, and that document said it would be done in five years. It's now been 31 years. Um, so two years ago, we created another plan, a bike walk plan 2017, and the transportation department hosted a dozen public comment period, uh, public comment meetings produced a nearly 200-page document outlining 75 projects, 25 of which were bike projects. Uh, and that reflected not just the time and effort of the planners, but also the community, our effort, our time, our passion. Not a single bike project has been laid in that time. You asked the community for our input, and, why, and we are waiting for your output. Is it going to be another 30 years? Also in 2017, the city adopted a Vision Zero plan to eliminate traffic deaths. Yet again, there has been no action on that. Recent studies have shown that installing separated or protected bike paths lead to a reduction of traffic deaths by 44% and traffic injuries for 50% for all road users. Let me say that again. Installing protected bike lane has the injury rate not for cyclists, not for pedestrians, not just for drivers, everyone. It, it benefits the entire community. For context, the Watch For Me campaign, you see all the stickers everywhere, that reduced traffic deaths by 5%. That's an order of magnitude difference. So I just want to remind you and all the folks here that safe bike infrastructure is an equity issue, as bike and walking is an affordable mode of transportation, and people of color are disproportionately killed on our roadways. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Nishimita. Sir, if you wanted to send me an email, I would be happy to uh, provide you with information about the uh, bike lanes, and uh, including our new uh, separated bike lane that we've just added. I'd be happy to let you know that if you want to send me an email, I'll be happy to provide that you with information. In the, that was not part of the original plan. No. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harmon, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Scott Harmon, 600 West Main Street in Durham. I'm a member of a group that was created um, out of the uh, Expanding Housing Choices Initiative. We call ourselves um, Neighbors for Housing Equity. And in addition to the work um, uh, that uh, Ideal Ortiz and I are, are doing with others to uh, try to remove some of the racial inequities that are in the, the structural systems of our land use ordinance, um, we support the four-point plan being introduced to the Planning Commission, a very highly simplified version of expanding housing equity that some of the most vulnerable neighborhoods in this city have uh, supported. It's much easier to understand than the proposals that have been put forth so far. More importantly, uh, it's not enough to simply change our zoning ordinances. Uh, we have to support the most vulnerable neighborhoods, and that's why I'm asking you to do here today in your budget deliberations. I'm asking you to double the eviction diversion program of legal aid to represent 950 households, expand city tax relief for long-time low-income homeowners, fund affordable housing programs to help renters, home buyers, and homeowners at risk of being displaced from neighborhoods with rapidly rising housing costs, and finance nonprofit and other affordable housing developers to buy land and build affordable homes with expanding housing choices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. I will now hear from Ideal Ortiz. Ms. Ortiz, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you. 
My name is Ideal Ortiz and I live at 1808 Bell Street. Um, today, I don't just wanna share with you what you should say no to. Um, I'm here to firmly say that I don't support funding for more police, but um, because our community does have a clear and beautiful vision of what you can say yes to, um, here's a clear path so that you can be the hero in our community story to live into the justice that I believe you, Mr. Mayor, said you ran um, for. And so we want you to bring that home to Durham, and this is a fuller way to realize that. Say yes to community-rooted partnerships for our tax-funded green infrastructure projects so that we end the harm caused by marginalized communities in marginalized communities by bike, ped, trail, and planning efforts that don't consider them. And I really thank you for already assigning that in the budget. Say yes to affordable housing efforts for eviction diversion. Say yes to financial resources to maintain, build, or expand affordable housing units in our city. Say yes to tax relief for longtime homeowners being burdened by rising property values. I'm sure you've heard of that from several speakers already. Say yes to living wages for all our city workers and not just the full-time city workers. Say yes to community-based resources to support safety that doesn't involve the police because we know how to keep one another safe. I'm saying yes to loving my beautiful city deeply, but that isn't going to be an easy ask, but I'm willing to make it and make it clearly. Say yes to these listed ideas. Be our community hero. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Mr. Hales, Mr. Hales, welcome. You have two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Dick Hales. I live at 100 Briarcliff Road, uh, speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit tonight, uh, with a large number of organizations and individuals that participate in our efforts. We've been closely following the Expanding Housing Choices Initiative, a group of amendments to our development ordinance that we feel will actively support compatible, small-scale infill housing as an important part of our overall housing strategy uh, for the city. Um, we're looking forward to the Planning Commission making a recommendation on that uh, on June 11th and sending it on to you all, likely for a public hearing in August. Um, to help ensure that um, these kinds of changes result in adding affordable housing units and not in increasing displacement of housing. Um, we think it's essential that we be prepared to set up new technical assistance and financial programs to help citizens uh, find out about and utilize um, accessory dwelling units, duplexes, and other ways of fitting in more housing stock to try and help keep up with the uh, growing population in town. Um, we ask that such programs be initiated immediately upon adoption of the EHC uh, to educate citizens and expect those programs to be available um, during the early part of the coming budget year. So we wanted to be proactive on saying we think it's an essential ingredient. The city of Portland, Oregon did these things and found that the number of accessory dwelling units, for example, grew tenfold over three years just from them making sure that property owners, homeowners, and others in the neighborhoods knew what the opportunities were, knew how to apply for permits, how to get utility um, waivers, and other things to help move them forward. Thanks so much. Appreciate your attention. Thank you, Mr. Hales. Um, I do want to uh, just mention that there is $3.5 million in the affordable housing bond for low-income homeowners to used to uh, be able to build accessory dwelling units. So that, I agree, and I think we all agree how important that is, especially uh, if we do choose to uh, expand uh, housing choices. Uh, I'm gonna now call uh, five more people, and if you could come over to my right. Uh, first will be Danielle Purifoy. Second will be Poet Williams, I believe I've got that right. Maria Monsanto, Mab Segrist, and Manju Rajendran, if you all could please uh, come over to my right, that would be great. Mr. Mayor. Folks, there, there are plenty of seats. Uh, if you could take a seat, that would be great. Thank you. Ms. Purifoy, welcome, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Danielle Purifoy, 2032 Inglewood. Um, I'm here 
to wholeheartedly support uh, the Durham Beyond Policing um, proposal for community-led um, safety and wellness task force. Um, this um, proposal um, puts forth or requests $200,000 um, in the first year for the task force to support um, research efforts on bolstering our existing community uh, safety programs, um, those both um, at the grassroots level and those already supported by um, the city budget, um, and then also to, um, to research other initiatives um, such as mobile first responders um, across um, uh, that have been um, successful in other uh, states and cities across the country. Um, one of the things that um, I want to particularly highlight um, in terms of things that the city um, actually currently funds but could fund at a much higher um, level is the um, eviction diversion um, efforts. Um, I want to um, be maybe the third or perhaps the fifth person to uplift this because um, one of the things that um, we know, right, um, um, uh, supports um, the reduction of uh, crime, uh, the reduction of conflict, support um, of um, folks who are on the streets because for various reasons um, is actually in the most um, cost effective thing is to actually uh, divert folks from being evicted in the first place. Now, our city um, uh, police budget right now um, is um, at $68 million. Um, currently, eviction diversion efforts receive $200,000 per year. Um, it's a radical difference. Um, it would, and they're only asking for $300,000 more per year. Um, I believe that we can um, divert at least that, if not much more, um, in order to support um, uh, diverting at least 10% of folks um, who are facing eviction um, in, this, in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Purifoy. <laughs> Poet Williams. Poet Williams. With the approval of the mayor and all these people here, um, two people who are part-time workers who have to leave um, now are asking for permission to speak before they leave. Okay, that's fine. Can you, who are they? Great. Come on up and please give us your name and address, and you have two minutes. All right. My name is Carlos Bennerman, 1504 Woodway Club Drive. I am a part-time worker for the Durham Parks and Rec of Walt Town. I uh, will just use my time as briefly as I can to speak to the points that I know. Uh, Part-time workers, work just as efficiently and as, as hard as full-time workers when it comes to uh, the programs that we provide, the extension of programs that we provide at Durham Parks and Rec. Uh, I want to just briefly just talk about one particular theory that identifies the need for higher wages, and that's Maslow's hierarchy of need. At the bottom of that pyramid, or bottom of that theory, is in the addition of resources such as food, clothes, uh, food, clothing, water, and other resources. If those things are not present, then it's hard for those to have safety within their community, and it also has an increase of crime rate in regards to the lack thereof. So it's important that when we start looking at these budgets, when we start looking at these ideas in terms of what's going to better our community, it's not the reinforcement of stricter rules. It's not the reinforcement of establishing uh, maybe a military or police presence. It's important that we look at other ideas. It's important that we look at grassroots efforts. It's important that we look at how we can strengthen our community overall as a whole. So job improvement, job training, being able to improve the minimum wage for part-time workers is the equation for that. And I'll just end on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ma'am, could you come forward and give us your name and address? You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Selena Cornegate, 2503 Hitchcock Drive. I am here for this, um, the um, City of Durham Part-Time Workers 15. I've been a worker for the City of Durham for over six, seven years. I've seen where they started from 735, and now we're just up to 10. I think um, when it comes to having a livable wage, I think the city could do better with all the infrastructure that you guys are doing now. I think you could... 
give a little bit more. We give a lot to our community. We are the forefront. We, a lot of us, are the faces of some of these establishments. I really believe we made the bond with the communities. You guys do the eight to five. We do all the after hours. So we are the one that leave our families behind to come and to stand in the gap to make your buildings run. That you guys put y'all faces in front and say, hey, this is our building, but we are the ones that help make it run. Also, when it comes to the more policing, I do believe that we need other resources. Even as an educator, we are taught to be able to handle children with disabilities, children with mental illness, children with behavior problems. And if you don't have the resources here to handle the situations we have in North Carolina or in Durham period, the policing is not gonna help if they don't know what to do. So you're gonna have to educate, you're gonna have to train, and with more job um, training programs, with more um, school readiness programs, and just with programs that's gonna help Durham in general, will help overall crime, and it will reduce everything that we need. And if we all can get together and come on one accord, it'll be just great. Thank you, Ms. Cornegard. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from Poet Williams, then Maria Monsanto, Mab Segrist, and Maju Rajendra. Welcome. Hey, how y'all doing? My name is Poet Williams, 3601 Weatherby Drive. Um, I work and serve at Forward Justice as Strategic Program Associate and as Community Organizer. I'm a member of Spirit House. I'm a member of the Harm Free Zone. I'm a member of All of Us or None, North Carolina, here in Durham. I'm a member of the Second Chance Alliance, and I'm a member of the National FICPFM Network. I'm here to speak against the hiring of the police officers and in support of the Durham Beyond Policing proposal. Um, it's funny, uh, Jillian, that you mentioned the uh, PB, PB uh, delegation earlier. I was a member of that delegation. And um, though some very good things came out of it and it was a very good process, especially to be implemented here in Durham first, um, I feel like it, it fell short and it failed specifically in the areas that um, it was supposed to target um, specifically. Um, with the approval of the Durham Beyond Policing uh, proposal, I feel like y'all have a chance to correct those mistakes. And specifically what I'm speaking to is, um, it was specifically supposed to correct past harm and to target areas, the, the most marginalized and directly impacted areas and the most directly impacted peoples, which from sitting through that process, personally, I believe that that was not the case for many different reasons. Um, and just lastly, I would just like to say that, um, and this is personally, this isn't as much as a suggestion as it is community and community partners coming together and telling y'all what it is that we need. For far too long have we had people telling us what we need or telling us what community, what they think that community needs. This is community telling you what we need. So I think that y'all should take heed to that and strongly uh, suggest the approval of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Monsanto. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Ms. Monsanto, welcome. You have two minutes. Okay. Hello, City Council, Mayor, members of the Durham Community Residents. My name is Mariah Monsanto. I live at 2341 Cherry Creek Drive. I'm a member of the Durham chapter of BYP 100, as well as part of the Durham Beyond Policing Coalition. I'm here in direct opposition and of the addition of 18 new police officers for this fiscal year and in support of the proposal for a community-led safety and wellness task force designed by Durham Beyond Policing. So um, let's get into it. Police and law enforcement and carceral systems are reactionary forces to crime. There is no correlation of an increase of police officers and a decrease in crime in the city of Durham. This is because crime exists because people's needs aren't met. 60% of our city's public safety funds go to policing. What would happen if we defined and funded public safety to include affordable housing, eviction diversion, livable wages for all city workers, um, food security, and properly funding community centers, first responders that don't wield guns, and so much more. As many people prior and after me commented on, members of the Durham community have put together this proposal for you all. To be clear, this proposal is a gift, okay? 
We, uh, you can show your appreciation by saying no to the 18 um, police officers and saying yes to funding this community-led um, safety task force. It's a gift because dozens of Durham residents that worked on this proposal did so without monetary compensation. We're asking for you to divert the funds that already exist that would go to adding police officers for this fiscal year to fund the, um, the initial year of the task force, which would cost which we guessed about um, $200,000. This would fund the resource the task force would do to implement alternative methods and practices and encouraging public safety. You all can keep your word in committing to a Durham Beyond Policing by funding this proposal. We residents of Durham expect you as our elected council people to represent our interests and not insult our intelligence any further and not trusting that we do not know what we need, that, that understand that we are all that we need and we do not need more police to keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you. And now here's the map figures. We'll now hear from Manju, you want to go first? May we do a mashup with uh, our two minutes right beside each other? It'll be me speaking first and then Mab. Friends, uh, I, I, I hesitate to do that only because I try to be do the same thing for everybody. That seems fair. We'll so, take turns. Yeah, thank I'll you. I'll go first, Mab. Thank, thank you. Thank um, you. My name is Manju Rajendran. I live at 2112 Summit Street. I'm a member of Sanctuary Beyond Walls. Uh, Azadi forgot to get one of the cards filled out, but she wanted you all to see a sign that she made. Um, we are part of uh, Durham Beyond Policing, which includes BYP 100, Southerners on New Ground, Jewish Voice for Peace, Communities in Partnership, All of Us or None, Sanctuary Beyond Walls, Spirit House and Harm Free Zone, Triangle Surge, UE 150 City Workers Union. We're a coalition of many organizations and community members invested in re-envisioning public safety. We see that current punitive models of public safety are steeped in violent dehumanization and captivity, neither of which is effective for preventing community harm or promoting accountability. Durham Beyond Policing initially came together to oppose the 2016 plan by the Durham City Council to devote $71 million to building a new police headquarters. We reconvened this spring around the Durham Police Department's request for a funding allocation to hire 72 new police officers over the course of three years. So it's not just 18 for this pilot, we're talking 72 rolled out over three years if this uh, comes to fruition. And Durham County's parallel misallocation of 59% of our county budget to jail and law enforcement rather than health, schools, and libraries. We believe that achieving community safety requires structural solutions, and the amount of money required to hire and equip these many police officers and sheriff's deputies represents a sum of public money that's never been directly devoted to creating and maintaining the resources that keep people secure. Education, housing, food, healthcare, employment, and city design. If you are part of Durham Beyond Policing, would you just raise your hand high in the air so it's clear we can't all get on the agenda tonight, but we are here. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Sigrist, welcome. You have two minutes. Mab Sigrist, 1419 Ruffin Street. I'm all, also here with the Durham Beyond <clears throat> Policing Coalition, and I, I'm a member of Southerners on New Ground. Um, I think that all the city council people have received copies of this um, report, Durham Beyond uh, policing proposal for a community-led safety and wellness task force. As has been mentioned before, a lot of people worked extraordinary amount of time uh, over and under their jobs and late at night and all together to get this before you. It has three different elements, the task force we were, we're requesting, um, to research and raise the profile of existing Durham-based community-led safety and wellness initiatives. We would learn from people in neighborhoods and organizations that are using methods grounded in an anti-oppression framework to solve their problems. These are conflict transformation, popular education, community accountability, collective care, transformative justice, and other forms of violence prevention or intervention. <clears throat> it we would find efforts that have tracked success over time in the city and explore how to bring them to scale with additional funding and support. They need your support in order to grow at a different level. We would also research uh, local community-led safety and wellness initiatives in other cities, particularly southern ones, for example, 
Where are pilots for trauma-informed first responder teams that don't include police? Oregon has wonderful ones. Or what does it look like when the shell of an old jail is converted into a wellness center? Ms. Ms. The Sagan's city. Pull back just a little for the mic. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. The city of Atlanta just converted one of its jails into a wellness center. Um, if they can do that, what could we do? We'd also like to work with city and county staff to research, map, and promote existing Durham city and county supported initiatives. Um, what would Right now, we give 60% of the budget to policing. What would it mean to flip that, um, flip that ratio? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to now ask, I'm going to now ask uh, five more people to please come over to my right. AJ Williams, Antonia Randolph, Aaron Finn, Kasim Bird Frederick, and William Tillman. If you all could please come to my right, uh, and we will begin with A.J. Williams. Is A.J. Williams here? Are you Mr. Williams? Please come forward and welcome, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, good evening, City Council members. Uh, my name is A.J. Williams. I live at 4504 M.O. Forest Drive. Uh, first and foremost, I want to speak to the energy of my comrades and the Durham residents who pour blood, sweat, time, research, those who have sacrificed hours to create a proposal in coalition with Durham Beyond Policing to counter the explicit attack on black and brown bodies by increasing surveillance and policing in our communities. I'm a proud member of the Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee, which was a win by Durham Beyond Policing to increase civic engagement and to give voice to the residents of our city. Well, once again, we're using our words and our collective voice. We've done the work to prove that we keep each other safe. The current political climate in which people who look like me, particularly black masculine of center folks, black and brown women, femmes, trans and gender nonconforming folks, we're being targeted by police nationally for simply existing in our day-to-day -day lives. I can guarantee you that adding 72 new cops to Durham's police department is not only triggering, but it is spitting in the face of the people in the name of public safety. Durham Beyond Policing isn't asking, we are kindly telling you to enact your power to allocate funding to a community-led wellness and safety task force that addresses our actual needs. Poverty, mental health care, affordable housing, fair wages, conflict de-escalation training, restorative justice, transformative justice. This is what we need. This is what Durham is asking for. We ask that you hold yourselves accountable and listen. And for the record, if I ever need conflict resolution, I will be calling Spirit House. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Antonia, Antonia Randolph. Yes. You have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Antonia Randolph um, at 2032 Inglewood Avenue. I want to speak um, against the uh, funding for 72 more police officers and support of Durham Beyond Policing's um, suggestion for how to spend the money to support a community-based wellness um, task force. I want to speak to community policing. I'm a sociologist. Um, and I want to talk about how community policing doesn't keep us safer. Community policing legitimizes police in our community. It puts people in an uncomfortable position of becoming informants on their neighbors. It uh, increases surveillance in communities um, such that commu communities get used to having more police in their communities even though they don't keep us safer. So community policing seems benign, but it actually is a Trojan horse to get people used to um, seeing police as the only way to solve problems. I want to speak to what actually keeps our community safe. Um, so much of police officers are called for things that would be better solved by community-led task force. For example, mental health crises. Um, police officers aren't actually trained to deal with those, but a lot of conflicts are come from mental health crises. Um, domestic violence situations. Police officers, again, not trained to deal with those, but they're all for those situations. So I want to argue that community policing is um, not the way to keep us safer, that we have better techniques within communities that can help us keep us safe um, 
that are alternatives to community policing, which only gets communities used to seeing police as the only way to keep us safe when there are other kinds of expertise and genius within our own communities that will keep us safer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aaron Finn. Aaron Finn. Aaron Finn, welcome. You have two minutes. I wonder if I can be heard on this at my height. Okay. Um, I'm Aaron Finn. I live at 907 Orient Street in Durham. Um, I don't have anything else to add um, per se, but I wanted to just voice that I am absolutely in support of the proposal for community-led safety and wellness, um, and that I'm also here with Durham Beyond Policing Coalition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kasim, Kasim Bird Frederick. Again, to make interventions. Kasim and William both are part-time city workers who really wanted to come and got caught up working um, because other people couldn't show up and they were asked to stay at the rec centers, so they're not going to make it. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from the next uh, five uh, speakers. If you could please line up over to my right. Sarah Vukalich is already over to my right. How'd she know? How'd she do that? Nia Wilson. Andrea Hudson, Steph H, and Tanya, Tanya Voich. And thank you for giving me a phonetic guide to pronouncing your last name, and I hope I did it okay. Um, Ms. Vukulich, welcome. You have two minutes. My name is Sarah Vukulich. I live at 710 Underwood Ave, and I'm part of the Durham City Workers Union, and I'm also a part-time worker for the city of Durham. Um, as you all remember from the first budget hearing, um, we showed up as a group uh, with a petition with 100 um, city workers signed onto it in support of raising um, the wages of part-time workers to a, a living wage. Um, I just want to say as a community member and as a union member that we deserve more, both as city workers as community members, we deserve more. Um, we deserve a broader vision uh, of public safety and a broader understanding of public safety. Um, Cops respond to violence. They do not prevent violence. Often cops escalate violence. Um, we deserve imaginative, community-based, life-supporting solutions to the problems that we face as a community. Um, and what that looks like is funding legal aid so people can stay in their homes, hiring first responders, more first responders who are trained to respond to mental health crises, um, living wages for part-time city workers, and funding this community-led safety and wellness task force that's being proposed. Um, in terms of uh, part-time workers' wages, I just want to name that two proposals are on the table. One of them is from our department. Um, that proposal is suggesting that wages be raised to $15 an hour, but not for another four years, and it's proposing that the bottom be lifted from nine to only 10. Um, that proposal is coming from people who make over $125,000 a year. They're wildly out of touch with what it is like to live off of 10, 11, or $9 an hour. They have no idea. The other proposal is coming from part-time workers ourselves. We are the ones who are, are living under these conditions, who are working multiple jobs um, to make ends meet. Um, and, are, and are also committed to these jobs. You know, as, as you saw, people who couldn't make it because they want to make sure that the rec centers are open and the, the kids have safe places to be. Um, so uh, if you don't fund cops, then you can fund this and everything else. Great. Thank you, Ms. Vukalic. And uh, we'll now hear from, okay, that's fine. Uh, Andrea Hudson, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrea Hudson. Everybody calls me Muffin um, at 322 Junction Road. Um, I'm here tonight. I'm the All of Us and None member. I'm the director of the North Carolina Community Bill Fund of Durham. I'm, I'm also with the Coalition of um, Durham Beyond Policing. Um, I do participatory defense, do court watching, I do court mobbing, I do a whole slew of things. And what I would like to have happen is um, I'm the director over at um, CIP, their food co-op. And um, we were on the participatory budgeting um, radar. We went all the way through and it got cut. But if you have ever been hungry, you will do what you need to do to make sure that you can eat. If you have been homeless, you will do what you need to do to survive. If you have, if you, those things that everybody should have, which is housing, food, clothing, and a job with the livable wage, 
If we had all of those things, the, the crime would definitely go down because people commit crimes not because they want to, they have a necessity and a need that's not being met. And if we call ourselves a community, then we would meet those needs. And those needs do not require having more police officers. If we had more police officers in my community, that's a problem because when I go to Hope Valley or I go to Trayburn, I don't see police officers. But when you go down Bentwood, Holloway, or you go to Macduga Terrace, or you go to Cornwallis, or you go to Liberty Street, you see a slew of police. But you can't see a police when you go up in Northern Durham. And if that is not over-policing the community and the neighborhood, I don't know what is. So what I would like to see happen is that the policy that was, um, the proposal that was proposed, fund those things. Fund food for folks. Fund housing for folks. Fun jobs for folks, because you have people who have skills, but because they have a criminal um, charge or background, they can't get those jobs. Because that little thing that says, oh, we don't want you, you're being discarded, you're being thrown away. We don't do that. We don't need to do that as a community. We need to keep those folks and make sure that they um, get what they need. Because if it wasn't for people taking a chance on me, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have a job because I was homeless, I had a criminal background, and I did what I needed to do to make sure me and my kids survived. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudson. Steph H. Hi, everyone. My name is Steph. I live at 2613 Chapel Hill Road. Um, and I'm here as a community member of Durham, but special shout out to Durham Beyond Policing and Black Youth Project 100. Um, I just want to give you all the definition of enforce. Right? And so it means to constrain, to compel, to enforce obedience, right? And so we're talking about law enforcement here. It doesn't sound too nice to me. Um, I was going to give you all two stories about over policing in Durham um, and excessive force through the police in Durham, but you all already know about this. Um, and so I'm just going to leave you all with this, right? I envision a world with zero law enforcement. I know this will take time, resources, political sacrifice, and financial risk. But I believe that the black youth of Durham are worth this, no to 72 new cops. And while we're at it, no to 22 school resource officers in Durham Public School. No to police and all of its different factions. I see a different car that has police on it every single day. Um, no to... Um, Police Community Task Force. Yes to community-based interventions, yes to grassroots organizing, and yes to a Durham beyond policing. And I do have one question for all of y'all. Are y'all answering questions? Okay. We're happy to hear your question, though. I would like to know um, which one of y'all have actually read the proposal by Durham Beyond Policing already? Oh, I think we, I can answer that one. Okay. Um, I encourage y'all to give it another look, read it again, read it again, and read it again, um, and approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just say, and let me just say that we're happy to answer any questions if anyone has wants to email us, or uh, that's probably the easiest way. We're always we're always happy to answer questions, and we get a lot of them. So please. Don't hesitate. Ms. Wilson, welcome. You have two minutes. Mm -hmm. My name is Nia Wilson. I live at 224 West Trinity Avenue. I am the co-director of Spirit House. What I will say is Ms. Jackie may not call us, but plenty of people do and have. Poet, Paul, Maya, Tay, Umar Muhammad, when he was with us, already were on the streets, definitely doing what needed to be done to interrupt and intervene in violence without the use of police. Our young people are doing it. Many of the young people out here are also trained to do it. We're already here. So I'm not going to take up a lot of time either. Durham Beyond Policing is ready to show up and show out for you all right now. Y'all ready? Stand up. I'm going to get my baby out of jail. I'm going to I'm going to get my baby out of jail. My baby wouldn't let me pay her fine. 
Thank you. We'll now continue our speakers. Uh, I'll uh, call to, I'm going to call the remaining names that I have. If you'll please come over to my right. Tanya Voich. Diane Stander. Chanel Chambers. Alexandra Valladares. Yesenia Castro. Let me ask, while these people are coming forward, is there anyone else here who would like to be heard at this public hearing tonight? If there's anyone else here that would like to be heard at this public hearing tonight, after these speakers finish, I'm going to close the public hearing, unless there's anyone else who would like to speak. If you would, please come over to the clerk's desk here and uh, sign up on one of the yellow cards. Okay, thank you. Ms. Boych, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Tanya Voich, and I live at 1014 West Forest Hills Boulevard. I am here to speak in support of the line item for a neighborhood protection overlay consultant to help planning staff evaluate the Forest Hills neighborhood NPO proposal. As you likely know, the NPO process is a process and tool written into Durham's Unified Development Ordinance and is intended to provide neighborhoods a direct voice in how their neighborhoods grow and develop. Our neighborhood overwhelmingly supports the NPO, the petition for which received signatures from 64% of residents in less than a four week period. I think we would have had a lot more than that had we had more time. I am speaking in favor of the NPO proposal and budget line item so that residents can establish a plan for growth appropriate to the neighborhood, a thoughtful plan for growth which in turn will help to protect important historic, natural heritage and recreational areas for the benefit of the entire city, and especially the core of the city, which is experiencing extraordinary growth and putting even, which puts even more pressure on our natural and open spaces. I have no explanation for that. Um, I take it as a good sign, anyway. Um, thank you for supporting this budget request and for the signal it will show of your support for Durham's unique historic, natural, and recreational areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Voich. Diane Standard, welcome. You have two minutes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Diane Standard. Um, I'm here to ask you to say yes to community-led safety and no to the increase of additional police officers. I'm primarily here today because quite honestly, I've held the hands of too many mothers who've been killed by our criminal justice system here in Durham, either at the hands of Durham police officers or in the cells of Durham County Jail. And their tears and their pain cannot be wiped away, they must be front and center in the discussion of what is happening in our community and many of their stories are in the report that Durham Beyond Policing have provided you. As many of you know, thanks to the work of this community um, since 2013 when Fade first brought the issue of racialized policing and traffic stops and marijuana arrest um, to the forefront of the debate, we've made a number of promising developments since that time. When we look at the data since 2013, we've seen reductions in traffic stops, reductions in ser searches, reductions in marijuana arrests, reductions in the number of people in cages. These are also documented. That is the trend we must keep moving toward. Unfortunately, the racial disparities still persist. Another reality we have to confront. The last thing I just want to flag is make sure you pay attention to uh, the graph on page 11 in the report that just shows how out of sync um, the staffing for the Durham Police Department is in relation to other departments in the city that are dedicated to safety, community development, economic development, water, infrastructure, public works. Despite the population growth, these things have stayed flat and really low below what is for the Durham Policing Department. So we're just asking you today to continue this work we've been doing together as a community and shift the investment into other types of resources that keep our community safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sander. <laughs> Chanel Chambers. 
Chanel Chambers. Hello, my name is Chanel Chambers, Mallard Avenue. Um, I'm actually um, one of the co-facilitators of Partners Against Crime District 1. However, today I'm speaking as myself, not as part of that group, um, or not for that group. Um, <clears throat> as the presenter uh, before me Chambers, said... Ms. Chambers, can you hang on one second? Sure. Folks, if you could shut the door, that would be great. We have other people speaking. We want to make sure they get heard. Please shut the door. Thank you so much. Ms. Chambers, welcome. You have two minutes. Um, as we all know, our city is growing, and I think that's actually a good thing because people want to live in Durham, um, which is a city that I personally love. I'm happy to, to live here, and I'm happy that more people are coming to enjoy it. Um, and as our city grows, I think it's important for us to grow responsibly. And to me, responsible growth means that public safety, including law enforcement, should be funded at a level commensurate with, that, with the growth of our city. Um, and in cases and in areas where there is a dire need, that special attention be paid to ensuring that those issues are addressed, um, not only with law enforcement, also with other services, um, so that people can continue um, to uh, be able to live in a city um, where they want to live safely. Um, so I appreciate the council considering an increase in the number of officers of our police department in addition to some of the other proposals that have been here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Chambers. I will now hear from Alexandra Valladares. Good evening. It's, uh, my name is Alexandra Valladares, um, 4918 Robinwood Road in Durham. Um, I have lived in different parts of the city. I, um, I'm a community organizer and also um, an advocate for anything that builds up our, our community. And as a community advocate, I want to see more investment in community efforts. I think that there is power in um, providing resources in terms of budget to some of these efforts that are um, bringing people who normally wouldn't talk to each other together to talk about what community safety looks like for them. So I'm very encouraged by across levels safety being talked about in schools and what that means for, for parents who take their children to Durham public schools, what safety looks like for uh, neighborhoods that have been, um, uh, have had incidents like Valley Terrace, House Avenue. Um, I'm encouraged for conversations and I feel like these conversations have not had enough um, support. I mean, there's already some support, but we can have more of that because I think that this is a community conversation that is not uh, clear cut for many of us, including um, as I talk to somebody who, who, who has been a victim you know, of, of any assaults, they're going to want to say one thing. But I can tell you personally, um, there are certain instances where we've seen that there's some training that is lacking. And until we get our police force to respond adequately to families, to have good community engagement, we've been out in the streets and we've had officers um, uh, tell some of our organizers that you're obstructing an investigation, you could be arrested. And these are people who mean well. So there's a need to get our police force to a level where they can understand what community engagement looks like and build trust. If we don't have trust, I don't think we should expand something that's not solid. I think we have already done uh, enough with expanding the police department, 80, 80, the new headquarters, 82 million. And there's going to be a pattern if we continue to expand something that needs some work. So how about let's keep these community conversations, invest in community. Let's, um, let's do that for our community, and then we'll see. Thank you, Ms. Valladolid. Ms. Castro, welcome. Welcome. Welcome, my name is Yesenia Castro. I work in 1816 here on the drive. And I just need a budget because I'm working with the veterans people. I'm working with the people who got a chemotherapy and uh, radiology every time. And this street is very, very bad with, the, with these big holes. And it's too hard with the people came from the chemo. They come in with the hard body and everything. And it's too hard to skip all this hole right there. That's what I need. You appreciate your help. We can fix it all this street. Because I work for the Duke people. I work in for uh, the people for the cancer center. And, and they come in with pain. And it's so hard to be they jumping on the street with this car, the big hole. 
and say what I need, please help for this, you fix it all this street because other thing is in the peaky hours is a lot of traffic is there and a lot of people need to be there on, on her appointments. That's what please I need a budget for that you can fix very good that street because I see sometimes they fix it apart, but they still and they coming continuously, they coming again the big holes. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Ms. Castro. Mr. Mayor, can I I'm sorry, sir. Ms. Vukulich. Ms. Vukulich. I, I had a, I had a question excuse, for the prior Excuse speaker. me a second, sir. Ms. Vukulich. I am running the meeting. Ms. Vukulich, yes, I'm, I, I appreciate you, but please, come on. Okay. Ms. Kessler, could you tell me which streets in particular you're most concerned about? Uh, is it Hill and Dale? Hill and Dale. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Mayor. Ms. Vukulich, did you have something you want to say to us? I wanted to humbly. Come, come to the mic. Come to the microphone, please. I just wanted to very humbly ask that one more city worker who just got off work at her other job be allowed to speak very briefly. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vukulich. Um, is there anyone else besides this person here, who I will recognize in a moment, uh, who would like to be heard tonight? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard at this public hearing? If so, you could please uh, go to this table and sign a card. You did that. All right, great. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can sign after you speak yourself, Ms. Vukulich. Thank you. Sure, come on up and give us your name and address. Thank you. You have two minutes. Sorry. Um, my name is Leonetti Batista. My address is 1717 West Lakewood Ave, Durham, North Carolina. Um, so I was here for one of the previous meetings. Um, don't want to totally go over the whole, my whole situation over again. Um, I'm just here in support, um, basically, of the living wage for part-time workers of Durham City, or the city of Durham. Um, I, I am myself included in that, and um, it's been really difficult due to circumstances out of my control and the accident where I'm, I'm left in a very difficult situation. And I think none of us should be in that position um, given the fact that we, we're committed and I've been working with them for almost two years. Um, it just would be incredibly helpful to take that hardship away if we had a living wage adjusted to cost of living, among other, among other things. Um, but most importantly, beyond the $15 an hour, I think that part-time workers should be included in the same step plan as full-time workers, um, which is adjusted for cost of living, and it rewards our years of service um, and commit, commitment to the city just as much as any full-time worker. Ms. Batista, thank you, and we remember your last time you were here, and we appreciate your being here. If you wouldn't mind signing a card before you leave, that would be great. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. You have two minutes. Hi. My name is Kristen Gorman. I live at 721 Millspring Drive. And I'm a member of DOST, although I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight. Um, I'm here to express support for consistent funding mechanism for the maintenance of existing and future trails and to also echo previous comments by my fellow DOST members, Dave Connolly and Laura Stroud. Um, many of our beautiful trails have experienced gradation changes over the years and are no longer in compliance with ADA standards. Uh, there's cracks and potholes and needs of repair, um, trailhead bathrooms in need of some sprucing up, uh, erosion in a number of places due to stormwater, among other issues. I want to focus my remarks through a mobility justice lens. Trails are not automatically neutral spaces. To make sure a trail is truly for everyone, a consistent effort and resources are required. For example, funding for repairs to make trails more wheelchair accessible. Durham is going to be hosting a conference on mobility justice this year called the Untokening. We ought to ensure the city is more than an exemplary host of such an event. Uh, the steps that I look forward to us taking in this direction are as such. One, address the critical maintenance concerns already inventoried by staff as needing 3.2 million for, of immediate repair. Then, provide the ongoing maintenance of trails by planning 350,000 annually for this expense. Um, three, ensure future trails are planned equitably by putting staff in place in NIS uh, we're assigned to advance equitable community engagement and um, 
finally fund the trail implementation program that will provide the city with a comprehensive feasibility study focused on the nine priority trails as um, elaborated by DOST. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Is there one, anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? Is there anyone else? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. I'm going to ask now if there are any comments by members of the council. Um, if not, we'll move on to the next item. But if there are any comments, I'd be happy to entertain. All right, hearing none, I think we'll move on to the next item. I want to thank everyone that was here for the public hearing. And we'll be taking up all these, uh, we'll be taking up all these uh, issues during the next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, we'll be moving on to now to item 41, zoning MAC change for the King's Daughters Inn. Ms. Struthers, welcome. Good evening. I'm Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I would like to state for the record that all planning department hearing items have been advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law, and affidavits of all notices are on file in the planning department. King's Daughters Inn rezoning map change Z18-00024 was continued from the April 15, 2019 City Council meeting. No changes have been made since that time. The following provides a summary of the case. Request for a zoning map change has been received from Dan Jewell on behalf of Colin Crossman for a parcel located at 204 North Buchanan Boulevard, totaling 0.603 acres. The site is presently split zoned Residential Urban Multifamily, RUM, and Residential Urban 5, RU5. Mr. Jewell proposes to change the designation to Residential Urban Multifamily. RUM zoning would allow for a wider range of permissible housing types and for a future multifamily conversion of the existing bed and breakfast. There is no development plan associated with this case. The parcel is currently designated as a medium density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission at their February 12, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed residential urban multifamily RUM zoning district by a vote of 10 to zero. Staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff and I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open and I'm first gonna ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council? Any questions for staff at this point? Ms. Struthers, did you mention the notice on this item? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Would you like me to repeat it? No, I just okay. didn't remember it. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a long night. And you noticed all the items tonight? Yes. Thank you. Um, any, any questions at this point by members of the council? If not, I'm going to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Colin Crossman, who is here as a proponent of this rezoning. Yes. Well, hello, thank you very much. I'm Colin Crossman. Uh, so some of you might know me. I've been <clears throat> out of town for a while. Um, anyway, being that it's a long night, I would just like to say we appreciate, um, we would appreciate your support on this and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Crossman. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on item 41, the zoning map change for the King Daughters Inn? Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on that item? If not, uh, I'm going, to do, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is now back before the council. This requires a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second to adopt the consistency second. statement? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. It also requires a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. second. And moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Crossman, wherever he may be, and good luck to you. Item 42, zoning map change, critter control 315 Sutherland. Ms. Struthers, welcome. 
Good evening again. Uh, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. I will now present case Z18-00025, Critter Control 315 Sutherland Street. Request for a zoning map change has been received from Lawrence Owens and Lance Farlow with 4L Properties LLC for a parcel located at 315 Sutherland Street, totaling 2.248 acres. The site is presently zoned Residential Suburban 20, RS20. The applicants propose to change this designation to Industrial Light with a text-only development plan, ILD. Text-only development plans are a new type of development plan that allow proffered text commitments that specify, limit, and or prohibit uses within the zoning district requested pursuant to UDO section 5.31, the use table. As the name suggests, no graphic plan is provided with a text-only development plan. This rezoning request includes a text commitment that the following specific uses will be permitted in the proposed industrial light zoning. Apiculture, clubs and lodges, nonprofit, daycare facility, places of worship, Retail sales and services, except antique shop, convenience store, with or without gasoline, drive through facilities, and payday lenders. Additionally, art, music, dance, photographic studio or gallery, veterinary clinic, animal hospital, kennel, self-service storage, vehicle service minor, offices, except conference center, retreat house, and drive through facility, light industrial services, research and development, and wholesale trades. The parcel is currently designated as industrial on the future land use map, which is consistent with the proposed zoning change. The Durham Planning Commission at their March 12, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed industrial light with a text only development plan, ILD, zoning district by a vote of 10 to one. Staff is available for any questions. Oh, sorry, forgot about the recommendation. Uh, staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. Uh, first is to adopt a consistency statement, and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And I'm first going to, I have some questions, Ms. Struthers, for you. I am, read that list of permitted uses, and I can't find it. Now, where is it? Uh, so that would be a text commitment. Um, it's included in the Attachment number, um, I believe it would be six, the Summary of Development Plan. Summary of Development, development Impacts? Uh, summary of the Development Plan. Since this is serving as a text commitment, um, it would be where you would typically see uh, the list of uh, committed elements found on a development plan that is graphic. So I don't, I don't have something that says Summary of Development Plan. I have... A summary of text only development plan, attachment six. Ours is in number five under application. It's just a Third title page wrong. Of attachment five, Mr. Mayor, I believe. Page three of attachment five, I think. I think. Yes. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Mm. I don't, not, not in mine. I think maybe mine's updated, and because I just updated right before the meeting. Seven. seven. Mine's seven. I mean, it's also attachment four. Let's see, it can there also it is. be found Yes, in the for me, it's attachment seven. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll appreciate that. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but uh, appreciate that. Um, what is the intended use this property? Uh, if the applicant is uh, here, can, he can uh, respond to that. Uh, since the request is for the um, the list of uh, uses, I can't specify specifically. Um, Understood. Understood. Thank you. I'll ask the applicant in a minute. Um, I, um, yeah, I think those are my questions for you, Ms. Struthers. Thank you. Any other questions, council members, at this point for staff? I would note that I have had previous conversations with the uh, applicant and uh, based on the context with their proposal. I, I, Council, could you use the mic, please? I'm sorry. I was just noting that I have had previous conversation with the applicant and based on the context of what they were proposing in the neighborhood that they are in and the com conversations they've had with their neighbors, I would support. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll now hear from, uh, we have two people signed up to speak on this. Karina Mule and Lance Farlow, are you here? Great. And you're both proponents of this. Let me first ask, is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? 
Is there one else here who would like to speak on this item? All right. Welcome. Well, uh, I'm going to give you each three minutes, and if you don't use all that, that's fine. <laughs> I don't need all that. Thank you. It's my first time doing this. Um, I am currently employed by Critter Control, and I also live at 304 Sutherland Street. So it is uh, directly across the street and three spaces over, and I very much welcome them moving into our neighborhood. And um, I used to work for the company a long time ago. I do believe it's a good company, and they're good people, and I hope you approve this. Thank you very much, Ms. Mule. Thank you. Mr. Farlow, welcome. You also have three minutes. All right. I'm not going to take much of your time either. Um, we just seek uh, approval. We've been working on this for about a year now, and um, to answer your question, we're going to use this as is right now. It's an existing church. Um, it's got nine, like a Sunday school rooms. On there, so we're going to use it as office. Uh, the sanctuary we use for storage. Um, Critter Control basically does wildlife remediation um, in people's homes, um, basically from Wake County all the way to Winston Salem. So we're going to operate all this out of here. Um, basically, our staff shows up in the morning, gets their paperwork, gets together, and they're pretty much gone all day long. So the office will be used basically for paperwork, answering the phone, and doing administrative work. Thank you. So it will be, the office will be for critter control. Correct. And you'll be using the existing building that's there. That's correct. All right. Um, I'll have some other questions, but first of all, council members, colleagues, questions at this point? Or any comments? Council Member Freeman? And then Council Member Reese? I'll cede for right now. Go ahead. I was just going to add that I, I really appreciate the the reuse of this space, recognizing that the church had closed down and that the it had gone vacant for quite a while, and just making sure that um, noting that you know you're not doing reconstruction like construction and there's not a lot of correct disturbance of what's existing. So. You know, we've Thank actually you. maintained the uh, property right now. Uh, they've been vacant since July, so we got permission from the current owner to come in and do basic landscaping and kind of keep it look up or kept up um, from landscaping and stuff like that to keep any potential uh, vandalism and stuff like that down. Thank you. Mr. Farlow, um, there's a large list of specific uses that will be permitted on this property. Okay. Uh, clubs and lodges, apiculture, daycare facility, place of worship, retail sales and services except antique shop, so forth, art, music, dance, photographic studio or gallery, veterinary clinic, animal hospital, kennel, self-service storage, vehicle service, minor offices except for conference center, retreat center and drive through facilities, light industrial services, research and development and wholesale trade. So I think that the what I'm struggling with a little bit is that understanding the, what your current plan is for the use of the property. Uh, and uh, as Councilmember Freeman says, planning to use the existing building. There's also, of course, the potential that the building could be sold and then could be used by, for some of these other uses. Mm -hmm. You're aware of that? Yeah. And so um, the, um, that concerns me. Okay. Um, I'm, I uh, you know, want to support you all being able to use this facility, uh, but this is a, a, a large list. I'm not exactly sure uh, how to, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. A, an animal hospital or kennel. Maybe that's a good use there. I'm not sure, but I think maybe if I lived very nearby, I might not think so. Um, I'm not sure, you know, about the uh, the, the auto auto repair. Um, is that really a sensible potential use there? Um, so I'm I'm a little concerned, and maybe what I'll do is I'll turn to staff and see if they have any guidance that they might want to offer uh, in terms of your thoughts about this list of potential uses on the property, uh, if it were to be either uh, Mr. Farlow or uh, 
a subsequent owner might uh, seek to uh, change the use of the bill, the uh, property. Sure. So good evening, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for that question. Um, during the deliberation of the Planning Commission, uh, the same concern that you're raising was, was brought up by the commissioners in terms of the range of permissible uses. Um, I think the commission was reassured by Mr. Farlow's representations, but you are certainly correct that under this pr these provisions, the property could be sold and redeveloped for this broad range of uses. <clears throat> As I think you're well aware, um, these are voluntary proffers and they're strictly voluntary on behalf of the applicant in terms of what they restrict. We could certainly accept further restrictions um, from this list tonight, but we, we wouldn't be in a position to M direct or mandate or recommend any. Understood. Well, I'll just, I will just give you, Mr. Farlow, the ones that concern me as I read this item over the weekend, um, given the location. Uh, the ones that concern me uh, are the um, the uh, kennel uh, the I, I could I could conceive of supporting the self-service storage, but not on this list. Uh, you know, at a future date, if you can if there was some proposal that came back with lots of different sorts of protections, but kennel, self-service storage, vehicle service, minor, uh, light industrial services, all of those are. I am concerned about those potential uses in this location. So I'm wondering if you would consider uh, uh, in your text commitment uh, removing those as permitted uses. Uh, one moment, if, if staff could uh, interject regarding the late industrial services, uh, that is the use tied to the proposed critter control use. Say again? Uh, the late industrial service category is what uh, the critter control use would fall Oh, under. that's the critter control use, got it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to knock you out of that, Mr. Farlow. <laughs> Besides which, I might want you to come to my house and get my raccoon out of my attic. We can do that for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, understood. Uh, those other uses, have you considered those as, uh, as a... So when we first started this process, um, we're a small business, and they offered the opportunity to do a text-only amendment versus doing a full development plan because yes, it's sir. very costly and, and take the property from being affordable for us and not. Exactly. That's so we great. took the I, I mean, list. That's a great. That's a great reform, and I thank our planning department for this. It's a. It's a really nice to see this text only uh, commitment come forward. That really does save money and time for our businesses, and is also. It's. I think it's better for everybody. So agreed, Mr. Right, I agree with that. So we took the list of all the potential uses for light industrial or for the industrial category, and it's got a lot of stuff on there. It's got hospitals, hotels. You know, a bunch of things that we went and said, it's only two and a quarter acres. Um, it does back up to industrial right now. Um, the frontage road right off of 70 between 98 and Cheek is pretty much heavy industrial. Um, Durham County actually has one of their uh, uh, maintenance facilities there. So the businesses that back up to this um, neighborhood, it's already there. So we're kind of on the north end of this development. Uh, there's no real uh, homes to the north of us. There are some uh, across the street. We did have a uh, neighborhood meeting um, in April, and we had uh, two of the homeowners come by and introduce themselves, and we talked to them for a little bit on that. Um, but on the things that are on there, we did want to preserve the value of the property down the road. Um, we're not going to own it forever, um, but we are on it. You know, we're moving from Bennett Memorial right now where we lease. And so this property is a great location for us. The facility we can move into and start using day one um, with no construction. There'll be, you know, paint and some stuff like that, but nothing uh, on there. So we did feel like we went through that list uh, several times with the staff and ourselves and came up with the things that at that property might make sense down the road. Um, if something different came in or they did something to the building, they would have to come in with some kind of a plan anyway. So at that point, it would open up for approval, I would think. But um, right now, I'd just be using it as is um, with those uh, designations on there. Understood. 
across from you is a substantial residential neighborhood right across the street. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that it, it, I would have a very hard time supporting, I do have a very hard time supporting this list of uses in this situation. I get that you want to preserve the maximum value of the property for future sale, but I also understand that I also see a long list of other potential uses which would be approved. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just let you know that. Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think it's actually not quite preserving the value of the property because right now the value has, a, the property has value is zoned at RS-20. This, this upzoning would increase the value of the property by allowing many more uses, including the one to which you say today you're going to put it, and no reason not to believe you, you seem like a reasonable guy. But in six months, your situation could change and you could sell this property and the folks that live across the street from this will be looking at the whole range of industrial uses. Um, and that's what we have to consider, not just what you're gonna do with it, but because if we, if we wanted to give you permission to do just what you wanna do with it, you could write a different kind of text only development plan that said just your particular use case. You didn't do that. You had good reasons for it, I accept that you, you gave it to us. But I don't think this is an issue of value preservation, I think it's an issue of value creation. Um, and uh, I share your concern, Mr. Mayor, about um, the potential uses and the, and the particular location of this um, parcel, but I'd certainly be willing to consider um, the application if, that, if the uses were pared back a little in the way that you've uh, recommended. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Reese. Uh, other comments? Councilmember Austin. I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned you had a neighborhood meeting and you referenced kind of two neighbors. So in light of the mayor's um, comment about there being a large residential community across the street, were there just, how many folks attended your neighborhood meeting? Was it just those two folks you referenced or mm -hmm. was it a larger? And it was basically uh, two that were right across the street from it. And we've had communication with another one. Um, she couldn't make the, you know, the day we had it. Um, but she did call and talk to us about it. Um, they've used the property for parking when it was a church, um, for parking or for uh, relatives and stuff like that coming in for some kind of a party or something like that. So we'd be open to something like that, working with the neighborhood. Um, the church did try to sell this as a church for a long time, and they had no success. And so they did open it up to businesses to come in there and so we feel like we're coming in there and kind of preserving that property so it doesn't become abandoned and become some for, you know, stuff to happen. So we are going to take in there and keep it up and keep it a safe place. Thank you. I'll just, Mr. Farlow, I will say again, um, I, I understand about the light industrial uses. It troubles me, but that's what you come under, and so... I get that, and I think that that's something I'd certainly be willing to accept. But for a kennel, self-service storage, or vehicle service, uh, to me, if those people want to come back for those uses at some future time and come to us with a different plan, that would be something I would be willing to listen to. But I'm going to be hard-pressed to vote for this with them inside this uh, descriptive list of uh, permitted uses. So if you're interested at all in changing your tax commitment, that'd be great. And if not, that's, of course, your choice. It's totally voluntary. So our dilemma right now is we have to be out of our current building by June 23rd. And we've had this under contract since July of last year. The seller is very anxious to sell this property. They're basically upside down right now um, because they've been covering the note payment, the insurance, and the upkeep for that period of time. And so they're motivated to have us come in. Um, we're motivated because we need a place to do business. And so I'm afraid if I take those things off the table, we'll be back having to come to this meeting again and... You can do it tonight if you'd like. You can take those, well, as staff, but I believe right now. Mr. Farlow could change those text commitments tonight by taking those three items out. Is that correct, Mr. Others? Uh, yes, we would be comfortable with um, the text commitments being revised to reduce the number of uses, uh, not adding any, though. So specifically, which ones were they again? Kennel, self-service storage, and vehicle service minor. All right, we're fine with that. Okay. Mr. Others, is that you heard that? You're 
Yes, we note that um, kennel self-service storage vehicle service minor will be removed from the um, list of specific uses permitted in the text only commitment. We'll work with the applicant to get that ironed out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farlow. And um, I understand your planned use for the building, but I, my concern is somewhere down the road, somebody else moves in there and does something else that might not be so good for the neighborhood. I, I understand that completely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or concerns, council members? All right. Um, anyone else like to be heard at this public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard at this hearing? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. Mayor, I move to adopt the consistency statement Second. consistent with the agenda. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as set forth in the agenda. Thank you so much. Is there as, as amended? As amended. Thank you. As amended by the uh, by the applicant. By the applicant. Thank you so much. Is there a second? Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes seven zero. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farlow. Thank you for your flexibility. Um, item 43, consolidated item, elevate at the park. And we'll hear from staff. Emily Struthers with the planning department again. Uh, this request is for a future land use map amendment and a zoning map change. It has been received from Jared Edens with Edens Land on behalf of Brian Weiss for two parcels of land located at 3700 NC55 Highway and 3706 NC55 Highway. The site area of the future land use map amendment is 15.53 acres and the site area for the zoning map change is 35.04 acres. The applicant has applied for a zoning map change from Office and Institutional OI and Residential Suburban 20, RS20, to Residential Suburban Multifamily with a Development Plan, RSMD. The applicant also proposes to change the future land use map designation from Office to Medium High Density Residential, which is 8 to 20 density units per acre. Uh, areas designated as residential open space will remain as is. Key commitments include that the proposed development will be limited to multifamily residential and accessory uses. There will be a maximum of 336 multifamily units. A 100-foot wide greenway easement will be dedicated. Impervious surface will be limited to 70%, and traffic improvements will be constructed, including a traffic signal and multiple turn lanes. Regarding the zoning context map and site history information, staff would like to point out that the adjacent site Odyssey Towns rezoning was approved by City Council on April 15th. The adjacent site is now zoned Commercial General and Residential Suburban 8 with a development plan. The Durham Planning Commission at their March 12, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed residential multifamily with a development plan, RSMD, zoning district and future land use map amendment to medium high density residential by a vote of nine to two. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. <coughs> the second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Struthers. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff and I'm gonna now declare this public hearing open. First, I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. Hearing none, I will uh, ask now if there are any speakers to this item. I see one, Mr. Jared Edens. Mr. Edens is a proponent, and I want to welcome you, Mr. Edens. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else tonight who would like to be heard on this item? Uh, Mr. Edens, uh, welcome. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. I appreciate your time this evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. Uh, I'll be brief. I want to highlight a couple of uh, comments from staff summary. I appreciate Emily's summary of our project. I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, we do have excellent infra infrastructure here for density at this location on Highway 55. Uh, roadways are well under capacity. Uh, we have water and sewer at the property with sufficient capacity for development. 
Uh, as Emily mentioned, we did complete a TIA as part of the project, and we're proffering a signal at Odyssey and 55 as part of this project. Uh, you may remember the property next door to the north also proffered the same signal at Odyssey and 55. I view this as almost a backup plan for that signal in the event that the adjacent property does get delayed, which it sometimes happens, this project would come in and install that signal. Um, you do have a lot of floodplain on the property, which actually works to our advantage because it creates a very large natural buffer between the development. Development's gonna be up on 55 in the east, but the entire western part of the site is, is floodplain and, and won't be disturbed. Um, and if we look at the 55 Odyssey node in general, you've got uh, three different housing choices there already. We're just adding more options. You've got apartments, uh, townhomes recently approved, you've got single family, so it's good to have those three options at that same location. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting last year. There's no opposition that I'm aware of. I do have uh, two proffers I would like to add. Uh, the staff report mentions that 53 additional students uh, will, will result from this rezoning request. So we're proffering to make a payment of $26,500 to the Durham Public Schools. That would be made prior to the first final plat for the project. Uh, our second proffer is to provide a payment to, to Durham's Affordable Housing Fund in the amount of $50,400. Uh, that's also will be made prior to the first final plat for the project. Um, be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edens, and thank you for the proffers. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing. I'm going to now ask if there are Questions or comments by members of the council? Colleagues, any questions or comments? I have one comment, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted, I've made this comment again, a number of us have previously. I just wanted to say how much the photographs in this particular staff report helped me envision what is, where this area is, um, and because I didn't have a chance to go drive by like I sometimes do. Um, and so I just want to thank staff again for starting to do that, because uh, it's extremely helpful. So thanks. Thank you, council member. You're awesome. I wanted to just note the concerns of planning commissioners. Um, planning Commissioner Brian uh, suggested that we require 15% of the units be affordable, and I wish we could. Uh, we are prohibited from this, uh, but I do think that, uh, so I will, I will let, I hope you will let Commissioner Brown know that. Um, Commissioner Baker quoted a resident concerned about the walkability and lack of placemaking in many of the developments that we're getting now in this area and others. And I think this is very well taken. It's a very important concern. Uh, and I hope that we'll be taking this up in our comp plan update. Um, I'll comment on the next item a little bit more about that, but I did want to note that here. Did you receive the two proffers, Ms. Struthers? Um, we would like to make a revision to the timing mechanism uh, rather than first final plat since this is multifamily just to ensure um, that does get received uh, perhaps prior to site plan. Um, if that is acceptable, we'll work that through with the applicant. Mr. Edens, is that acceptable? Yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, it requires first a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use plan. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt a resolution amending the future land use plan. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The resolution passes 7 0. Thank you. Now we need a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Thank you so much. Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. And finally, to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Ordinance passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Edens. We'll now move on to item 44, consolidated annexation item 5816, Barbie Chapel Road. Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. 
regarding 5816 Barbie Chapel Road, annexation case BDG 180018, a request for a utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map change have been received from Tim Smith for one parcel located at 5816 Barbie Chapel Road, approximately four acres. The site is presently zoned residential rural RR and Falls Jordan Watershed Protection Overlay District B, and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The parcel is designated very low density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. This annexation petition is for contiguous expansion of an existing satellite to the corporate limits. The proposed annexation area is located between the existing satellite and existing city limits. Should the council act favorably, approval, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective June 30th, 2019. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Staff is available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Struthers. Colleagues, you have heard the report from staff. I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open and I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for staff at this point. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reese. Um, I, I, if it's in the attachments, I missed it. And if it is, I apologize. The, the, but the context map indicates that the newly annexed triangle, we'll call it the triangle, one of the vertices uh, is adjacent to Barbie Chapel Road. Is, the, is there, would the uh, owner of the underlying property, assuming the annexation goes forward, would they be authorized to have an, an access to Barbie Chapel there? or would it have to go through the existing, I'm assuming it's the same property owner? My assumption, but I will refer to uh, Bill with transportation, is that because it's just a point that connects to Barbie Chapel Road, they would need additional um, access. Yes, Bill Judge, transportation. The, uh, they don't appear to have enough frontage there to put in an access with the public street, so access will likely have to be from the existing stub street to the south. And is this the same? Um, oh, thank you, Bill, appreciate yeah. it. It's more for you. Is this the same owner as the satellite, or is this completely different owner? Or uh, the the is owner it? is separate from the um, existing neighborhood. But that, so obviously, given all this, that um, I guess cul-de-sac Stub Street is going to have to be opened up to give access to that property, correct? Uh, yes, I believe Nettle Ridge would need to be extended to the property line. Um, And do we have any indication about whether or not the applicant uh, reached out to those folks about that aspect of this process? I'm not able to answer that for the applicant. If they're here, they may be able to. Fantastic, thank you very much. I believe we do have the applicant here, Mr. Tim Smith. Um, but I'm gonna first ask Mr. Reese, is there anything further? No, that was, the, that was my issue. Sure, mm -hmm. any, any other colleagues, any other questions at this point for Mr. Others? If not, uh, what we'll do uh, is we'll hear Mr. Smith, who's signed up to speak. Uh, Mr. Smith, you have three minutes, but first let me ask, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there one else here tonight? Senator McKissick, you would like to be heard on this item? Are you a proponent, sir, or an opponent? Proponent, okay, thank you. Um, come on up, Senator, and as soon as Mr. Smith finishes, we'll get you and uh, Welcome to the chambers tonight. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, welcome. And then after you've finished and, and uh, Senator McKissick has finished, we'll uh, go to uh, Council Member Reese's question. Uh, yes, sir, I'm Tim Smith with Summit Design and Engineering here tonight. I represent the applicant, uh, Mr. Bill Chambers. And uh, Mr. Reese, can you repeat your question again so I can be sure and answer that properly? Sure, um, it appears to me that um, the only way to access this property from what I can see here is to extend Nettle Ridge uh, Road um, through the end of the satellite city bubble of property through the into the uh, area subject to the annexation request. Is that, is that correct? That's correct at this time. They do have a very small uh, piece of right-of-way frontage on uh, Barbie Chapel, but it's, it's not big enough as uh, Mr. Judge mentioned to you know, gain access. The Nettle Ridge public street touches the property that we're requesting annexation for, so it would 
it already has the ability to uh, have access to the property and the, the public right of way already touches that piece of the property. So they could extend a driveway into this, uh, this piece. Th this is just gonna be a residential use uh, for a, a single family dwelling. So uh, there's no need for uh, an extension of the street per se. So, okay. Yeah. Um, that, does that answer your question? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, do you have any further remarks uh, concerning this uh, that you would like to make at this time? I will make another comment about uh, the, the frontage on Barbie Chapel. The, uh, my client is looking to obtain some additional property to gain enough width there to allow uh, an access as an option. Uh, we'll be working uh, going forward with city planning and transportation to make the determination as to which uh, would be the most preferable access uh, according to their regulations. But my client would like to have the option uh, to, to possibly come off of Barbie Chapel. So he's working with the adjoining property owner to see if that can be established. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Senator McKissick, any comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I think Mr. Smith has touched upon the issue I would have addressed. There are negotiations ongoing to provide that old alternative point of ingress and egress. We are optimistic that an easement can be negotiated or the property can be acquired. So I Thank think you that so would much. address Councilman Reese's concern. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, could I just add sure. briefly that I wanted to recognize that Senator McKissick, in addition to being one of our state senators, is also a former member of this body. Thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, council members, any questions or comments for the applicant or for staff? If not, I'm going to ask if there's anyone else that would like to be heard on this item. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, the first motion to be required is to adopt an ordinance annexing 5816 Barbie Chapel Road. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we annex 5816 Barbie Chapel Road. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. <coughs> Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Uh, second will be the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. And third, to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to item 45, Oregon Street closing. Good evening. Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Oregon Street closing case SC 18-00001 was continued from the May 6th City Council meeting. Uh, the applicant has requested a continuance to allow for additional time to coordinate a meeting with the stakeholder who is currently out of the country. At the applicant's request, staff recommends continuing this case to the August 19, 2019 Council meeting. Staff is available for any questions. No, no questions. I mean, no, no problem. We will continue to the August, what was the date? 19th. August 19th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and now item 46, consolidated annexation, annexation item, 1001 Olive Branch Road. Ms. Sunyak. Good evening. I was missing you. Mm. <laughs> Thanks I was missing around. you. Good evening. This is um, 1001 Olive Branch Road, BDG 18000008Z 18000015. <clears throat> Request for utility extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and zoning map change has been received from Arnaldo Escavera um, of Withers Ravenel for two parcels of land located at 1001 Olive Branch Road, totaling 216 and change acres. The annexation is for a contiguous expansion of the city limits. <clears throat> In addition, the applicant has applied for a zoning map change um, from rural residential to planned development residential uh, 2.686 with an associated development plan that stipulates up to 562 single family attached and detached residential units. The area is designated low density residential on the future land use map, which is consistent with the zoning request. 
If approved, the annexation petition and associated applications will become effective on June 30th, 2019. Key commitments include a maximum of 90 dwelling units prior to a second point of access to the roadway network, additional asphalt for the construction of a future bicycle lane, dedicated right-of-way for roadway improvements and a series of TIA, transportation impact analysis uh, required roadway improve improvements which are outlined further in attachment 8H. Um, the public works and water management departments have determined that the existing water and future sanitary sewer improvements associated with the Searles project will have the capacity for the proposed development. The budget and management services department determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately following the annexation. Um, and additional information on that can be found in the staff report. The Durham Planning Commission at their March 12th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of nine to two. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance <clears throat> annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is to adopt a consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Colleagues, you've heard the report from staff. I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open, and I'm gonna ask first if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. Hearing none, I'm going to uh, now turn to, and we have one speaker who signed up to speak on this item, Randy Herman. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item tonight? Mr. Her Herman, you're a proponent of this project. Welcome, and you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, it's obviously late for everybody, so I'm not going to take up my whole three minutes. Um, but uh, my name is Randy Herman. I'm here from the Banks Law Firm representing the applicant. We also have with us Arnaldo Acabario from Withers Ravenel, who is the engineer and uh, Brittany Chase, who is the uh, traffic engineer on the project. If the uh, council has any questions for either of them related to this project. Um, staff obviously summed up the uh, situation uh, accurately. Um, one thing I would point out is the utility extension agreement, which is going to uh, require the applicant to install a significant amount of uh, sewer to get to the uh, Southern Regional Lift Station, which is up near 98, um, 3,800 feet of 15 inch sewer and 5,200 feet of 18 inch sewer. Um, this sewer line will uh, provide for the future development of the surrounding parcels along Olive Branch Road, uh, which should open up a significant amount of development in, over in that east end. Uh, we are the farthest east parcel that has the low density residential designation on the future land use map. So adjacent parcels, we would expect to be uh, at a lower density, um, but it should allow for uh, additional development in those areas. Um, the traffic impact analysis uh, indicated that the um, road traffic on the existing roads, uh, it, the uh, improvements that would be required at most of the adjoining intersections are already uh, agreed to by the uh, Nichols Farm development, which is adjacent, and uh, so, the improvements that we will be doing are immediately adjacent to our property on Olive Branch Road and also putting in a major thoroughfare road going through the property east-west. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I or uh, any of the other members of the team are happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Uh, I'll ask first colleagues, any questions or comments for the applicant? Mr. Herman, um, you, you uh, you heard a previous applicant uh, make some voluntary proffers to Durham Public Schools, as well as to the city's affordable housing fund. Uh, this project is adding 106 students to Durham Public Schools. Uh, many uh, developers uh, make a voluntary proffer of $500 per student to our Durham Public Schools. Have you all considered such a proffer? Um, we have, we believe that the, um, the Improvements we are making uh, in terms of the sewer access are going to be a net, net benefit to the city. Um, and in addition to the widening of the adjacent roads and the installation of the thoroughfare, which we believe will be a uh, benefit to the city, 
Um, we also ha haven't had any indication from Durham Public Schools that there is a uh, any kind of um, issue with capacity in this uh, eastern part of the city. Thank you, Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, uh, what is the price point on the units? Uh, so it should be a pretty wide variety. Uh, about 25% of the units are going to be attached uh, townhomes. Uh, there will also be a significant number of detached houses in a variety of price points. Um, so I would expect the townhomes to be in the uh, 250 to 300 range um, and the detached houses uh, higher than that, but we should expect to see a, a mix of different Give me a range. Uh, um, so for detached houses, uh, you should expect to see anywhere from 300 to 450. And uh, there'd be how many detached units? Uh, so it's a total of up to 562 units. Uh, let me get the numbers real quick for the detached, uh, but it is uh, around 400. Around 400 of the 500 and some 60 units are be detached. And the price range will be in the three hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollar range. Uh, have you considered a voluntary proffer to the city's affordable housing fund? Um, we uh, have considered that. Um, we believe that the um, this is obviously out in the um, more rural part of the city, or currently the county, but to be annexed to the city. Um, we believe that the units that are being developed are consistent with the price ranges of other units in the area, uh, and so we don't believe that there's going to be an effect on affordability in that part of the city. Mr. Herman, uh, thank you very much. I have some questions now for staff. The uh, Commissioner Baker, Nate Baker, uh, had a substantial comment um, and Ms. Sunyak this might be for you it also might be for uh, Mr. Young I, I'll ask the question and then you all can decide um, well hang on a second I got to get to the right attachment Attachment 8G. Um, I have 17 as planning commissioner's written comments. But my computer doesn't seem to want to bring it up, but I'll, I'll uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Attorney. Um, yeah, okay, mine just came up. Thank you so much. The, um, We're building new homes, and that is a good thing for addressing our housing crisis, he says, is a misconception. The theory is here. Yeah, so, um, and he discusses the, uh, the fact that we have many single-family, auto-oriented, low-density sprawl developments. We've decreased livability and pushed low-income populations further and further from the livable neighborhoods. They're built according to the design principles of traditional neighborhood design. Um, if we only build one type of housing, one type of neighborhood, we're driving up prices in our mixing, mixed housing, pedestrian friendly, transit accessible, mixed use neighborhoods. We should be creating more of them. And his point is that this is not one of those neighborhoods. And then uh, also, uh, he also has a, another misconception that he lists. We just make until the, wait until the new comp plan and potentially subsequent rewrite of the UDO until we begin to make environmentally and fiscally sustainable development decisions. Um, so I just have a couple of questions about that. And uh, my first one is uh, the, uh, what, what, I, I just, I just asked generally, what is your response to that? Is Mr. Baker right in his description of um, the kind of neighborhood that we are creating, um, and uh, is it, yeah, I'll start with that, Mr. Young. 
please finish your question if you like. Uh, that's okay. Uh, is, is he correct in, in, in this description of the kinds of neighborhoods that we're creating when we create this? This essentially has two kinds of housing um, and, and uh, is a neighborhood which is uh, not what we think of as the kind of urban design that we are trying to encourage other places. So just wonder your thoughts on that. Sure, so uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, Pat Young with the Planning Department, members of council. I think both Commissioner Baker and, and you are bringing up a very uh, important point, which is that our current comprehensive plan adopted in 2005, um, this isn't exactly Mr. Baker's point. Let me make it my point and then talk about how Mr. Baker has addressed it. Yeah. Our current comprehensive plan um, pretty clearly calls for low density auto dependent development in this part of the community. I think that's the reality. Mr. Baker is trying to make the argument that it's inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. We vehemently disagree with that. We had a long conversation following up these comments with him. Um, some of the provisions he cites here refer to changes to the UDO that uh, should be made or could be made to make development you know, more, more transit-oriented, more interconnected, um, less auto-dependent, uh, and those are all things that we have tr tried to um, adopt through the Unified Development Ordinance, but, and we believe we have over time. But overall, looking at the diversity and type of housing in this part of the community is going to be one of the key focus areas for the comprehensive plan that we'll be kicking off in the next several months. Um, so I, I, the, the term sprawl is very loaded. Um, I think you've heard, I think staff did a good job of characterizing the fact that there are very substantial city investments going on right now. The Southeast Regional Lift Station, or Searles, um, is intended to support a significant amount of development in this part of the community. Um, the roadways that this applicant will be developing in their development are gonna be just as to the same standards as any city street in the suburban part of the community. We do have a significant concern about the fact that these are um, essentially what amount to uh, country roads, state roads that are out in this part of the community, like Olive Branch and the adjacent roads. They're not gonna fully retrofit those to city street standards. So that is something we're gonna look at very carefully with a comprehensive plan about whether it's appropriate to put even this level of density on those roads without retrofitting and modifying the roads. If some of you have driven maybe in Western Wake County, Morrisville, Cary, we, we don't wanna have that situation where you have um, thousands of acres of two to three unit uh, uh, density development on, on state roads. But this is what the comprehensive plan calls for and we, we very much feel like what the applicants proposed is consistent with that. So I'm sorry if that was a bit long-winded, but it's no, a very important point. Uh, do you share the concern that uh, Commissioner Baker expressed that things are moving very fast out there and we are getting lots of developments that are in some ways similar to this and that we're, because we're on the timeline we are with the, the comprehensive plan and so forth, that we're not gonna be able to respond, we're not gonna be able to put in place um, as at the speed at which we need to, the kinds of things that we want in our comp plan uh, to, to uh, you know, improve the kinds of, you know, to get the kind of uh, development that we want. Do you have concerns about that and do you have any thoughts about it? We do have concerns about it. Um, but again, I, I'm a believer that a lot of these property owners have substantially relied on the process that led up to the 2005 comprehensive plan and um, making plans to sell and develop their property. So that's something we're trying to carefully balance and consider. Um, we think that they should only be held to the current comprehensive plan. Um, that being said, we're working as quickly and assiduously as possible to try to get those new standards in place. Um, it is a concern that the Searles project that I've referred to is something that I think is encouraging along with Easton Connector. Uh, development of Briar Creek and Raleigh and a number of other factors. Uh, this is really one of the last reasonably affordable portions of the triangle that's in the three core counties. So um, it's coming at us very fast and it is a concern, but I don't think I'm, I and mean, you didn't ask this, but I'll go ahead and say it. I don't think we're at a point where we should recommend a moratorium or anything of that nature. No, I don't think I don't there's either. enough warrants for it. I know you didn't say that. Yeah. 
so I, I think our, our policy responses are fairly limited other than you all um, requesting modifications or denying these types of requests. Uh, may I make a point as well, Mr. Mayor? Yes, you may. Uh, currently, the property is zoned rural residential, which allows for development at two units per acre. So the applicant has the ability of right to develop at a residential subdivision at that density. What we're asking for is an increase in the allowable density to uh, allow for more units on the property. Thank you. Mr. Herman, you're an attorney with the Banks Law Firm? Yes. The Banks Law Firm is a great law firm, and it's known for representing affordable housing developers, is it not? Yes. Including housing authorities, including the Durham Housing Authority. Yes. And so you're well aware of the affordable housing uh, need in our community, which is very extreme. Absolutely. And you're aware of the fact that the Durham City Council has uh, set up an affordable housing fund. Yes. Yeah. Mayor, if I'm and you, um, had you thought about a affordable housing proffer before I asked the question? Uh, yes, certainly we have. Um, uh, I'm not authorized to make a proffer tonight. We would have to get the applicant in here and, and uh, continue the matter. Uh, but it is something we have discussed. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Council Member. If I might, I just want to ask, um, I'm not sure if anyone's here from water, but I noted that there is a demand that would, in, or an increase in demand that would be about 48,000 per day. And I'm concerned that that type of demand in that area might not fit for the context in that rural placement. And so I just want to make sure that we are also looking at that aspect of this conversation and recognizing that it's zoned currently for a lower density based on the fact of that ability to pull water. So uh, there, Jamie Sonyak with the planning department, there is not a representative from the water department or public works um, here, but the utility extension agreement has been vetted um, by that department and does include significant upgrades to have the site and that area serviced by water. Um, so they did not have any issue in terms of the serviceability for it. I'm not talking about specifically service. I'm talking about quality. I'm talking about where it's coming from. I'm talking about like the extent of All that's considered. from 40, up to 48,000 gallons per day. And I would also add the, the increase in vehicle trips is also concerning and uh, as a potential impact, it, noting that there's, we've already had these conversations about Vision Zero and making sure that folks are safe on the roads, not just vehicles, but also pedestrians and bike. Um, there's just a number of concerns that, that I have, and I would like to have a conversation with the Water Department about the, the, that increase, that level of increase as well, so. We'd be glad to do that, Councilmember Freeman. That's really not, that's a significant number in terms of the, the numbers they deal with, but we can get that for you. Thank you. So the uh, the average, let's just say that the average home price was $300,000. It's more than that, but sure. let's just say that. And there are 560 units? Yes. So the math on that is this, this development, when it's fully built out, will be a $168 million development. Did I do that right? Yep. Sounds about right. Close enough. $168 million development. <clears throat> All right, uh, Council Member Alston. Thank you. Um, and am I correct that you said you your, your client is also not making a proffer for the Durham Public Schools? I want to make sure I heard that. That's correct. correct. So I just wanted to make a, uh, I wanted to comment um, I, kind of as a general matter, um, but in cases like this where, you know, you're adding potentially up to 100 students um, while that may not cause the school system in that area, the schools in that area to exceed its capacity, that's still a significant number of students um, and has a significant impact on our schools and on the community. Um, so I just I couldn't go without making that comment in response to your statement about your... Thank you, Council Member. All right. Any, uh, anyone else need, uh, would like to be heard on this item? Yeah, question. Mr. Mayor Patam. Thank you. Could you describe, um, if you are aware, the process by which the applicant determined the number of single family and the number of townhomes to put on the site? 
Uh, yeah, it's a market analysis uh, based on the surrounding neighborhoods and uh, the types of units that they typically see uh, being sold in those neighborhoods, um, and uh, also based on uh, the the total number of units that they need to sell in order to make the um, property viable. Um, there's also issues, the, the property is divided by Olive Branch Road, so there's a smaller parcel and a much larger parcel. Uh, the much larger parcel is uh, split apart by a major stream that's running through there and there'll be significant stream buffers. Um, so there are buildable areas that are larger or smaller, uh, and depending on how large those areas are, the smaller areas uh, tend to get a set of townhomes. Uh, large areas tend to get detached houses. Um, so part of it is, is site dependent and, and based on the conditions of the property, and part of it is based on what the uh, developer believes the market will bear. Thank you. Is that uh, market analysis process, um, is that also how you determine the size of the housing and the cost for the housing based on what's in the area? Yes, and also um, partially because the uh, applicant is a home builder that works um, in the triangle and uh, has certain um, uh, floor plans that they use. Uh, they tend to replicate the same floor plans uh, that they know have been successful in other neighborhoods, and therefore they tend to um, be about the same size as the lots and the houses that they've developed in other communities. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. House member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I struggled with this one a little bit, and, and Commissioner Baker's comments I, I also found very compelling. They were intellectually compelling. Uh, but I thought a, a, a useful counterpoint was Commissioner Miller's uh, comments in tension with Commissioner Baker's, who I thought provided a good kind of letter of the law grounding uh, of the discussion, although a lot of what Commissioner Baker said uh, resonates uh, with me. Um, so while, while I, I um, you know, obviously fairness is, is, is an equal treatment is, is, is important to not just me, us as a council, I, I do strongly um, understand the, 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 the reticence, uh, if that's an appropriate term, the reticence with, with uh, this particular project, but there are others out there. I thought Commissioner Miller's point that um, Research Triangle Park, Park is a good reference point as opposed to downtown Durham. Um, with this with this particular project. I do want to say, Counselor, and, and the, the Banks Law Firm are great friends of mine. Um, the, the, the proffers are totally voluntary for, for uh, the Affordable Housing Fund and DPS. However, I will say that the precedent that's been established is not the rationale that you've given not to do it. Uh, that, that, that other developers that have made did not use that same calculus to arrive at their decision. So I just want my friend at the Banks Law Firm to know that had nothing to do with uh, uh, a calculation of how crowded the schools are in that area or, or whether or not there's an affordable housing issue in that particular area. So for whatever that's worth, that's, that's not the precedent uh, that's been established. Um, while with great deference to, to Commissioner um, Baker's comments, I think uh, Commissioner Miller's comments provide, uh, once again, a kind of a, a letter of the law um, reading uh, for me. Um, so I'll be supporting the development. Thank you, Council Member. All righty. Any other, Mayor Pro Tem? One more question. I'm sorry. Sure. No, go ahead. Take your time. <laughs> if this uh, rezoning does not pass, what will happen on this property? Um, I can't say that for sure. Uh, obviously, the property has remained uh, vacant for many years. There have been previous efforts to develop it, um, it you know, over the past probably 15 years or so. Um, so it's possible that it will be developed at the allowable density uh, of two units per acre. It's possible it will remain vacant. Um, the, you know, my client and any other possible buyers that would be interested would have to go back and, and make their own analysis as to uh, whether or not they can make a viable project out of it. So your client does not currently own the property? No, they're under contract. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm also struggling with this. I find myself significantly persuaded by um, by Planning Commissioner Baker's comments uh, and am concerned about increasing this type of development, this sort of low density development in areas where we could very easily encourage higher density development that I believe would be 
better for our community and could potentially address our housing shortage and our affordable housing crisis more significantly. Um, of course, we always take the risk that by not approving an upzoning that the property will be developed at a lower density, um, but the knowledge that it has not been able to be sold to be developed at that lower density for the last 10 years um, reassures me that that, uh, that developing it at um, residential rural is perhaps not financially feasible and that we may get a better, um, we may get a better project in this, um, in this area in the future. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Great points, Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Any other comments, any questions? Mr. Mayor, may Mr. I just, Young, um, sure. the <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem addressed the question to the applicant, but I would like to very, if, you, if you'd if you indulge me, weigh in very briefly. Please. Just to remind you all, this property is not currently in the city limits and would have to be developed. The applicant is, of course, correct that it could be developed by right at the lower density, but I think the fact that there would not be city utilities available without annexation is very limiting to development. Does it make it completely impossible? Just to reiterate the point that I think the Madam Mayor Pro Tem was making, that um, it's, it's highly constraining. And I do think, to your earlier question, um, that's an area we can pot potentially look at further. The 2005 comp plan didn't get into that, but that properties that are outside the city limits you know, don't have any uh, direct expectation or, or to, to get these utilities and to develop at that higher rate. So, Thank you. That was very useful. Mr. Mayor, I would just briefly like to sure, go ahead. work on this one. Um, I'll be honest, I, I don't know how I'm going to vote on this. Just be honest, I usually say one way or the other, and now I don't know, and let me tell you why. Um, Commissioner Baker made some very persuasive remarks, but he, or comments, but he made very similar remarks uh, on a rezoning, I wanna say two months ago-ish, mm -hmm. um, that was perhaps not quite as remote as this one, although not terribly f much farther. Uh, this one is not terribly much farther. Um, and uh, at that time, I was persuaded by the um, by the argument that the proximity, to the extent you call it that, to um, uh, the RTP uh, could create another urban node in that area um, and that this kind of density might conceivably be justified there. Um, but I also agree with the mayor pro tem that that, and with Commissioner Baker, that we, we can't, uh, it's difficult for us as decision makers to continue to talk about the things we want and then vote to support things like this. Having said that, um, the Mayor Pro Tem's vision of denser um, residential development on this particular piece of property is con supporting that is contingent on things that don't exist right now. This is a two-lane state road over which the city exercises no control. We cannot expand it. We cannot, and, and I don't, I suspect there are no plans mm -hmm. to, uh, to bring bus service out to this particular area. So um, even if it were um, developed more densely, that's just more cars on these roads we don't maintain and can't expand. Um, so all that is to say this is a bundle of stuff. Um, that we're dealing with, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in hearing more about uh, the issue that Councilmember Freeman brought up around uh, water capacity in this area. I did hear the expansion, as you mentioned, the expansion of the lift station, um, but um, my own personal opinion is that I, I would certainly benefit from some additional time to consider some of the nuances of this project. I do, in, in my opinion, um, the decision is an equipoise. It, it could go either way with me, depending on very small uh, factors one way or the other, um, some of which we have discussed tonight. Um, and so uh, I wonder if um, uh, reconsideration at uh, a subsequent meeting might give us all an opportunity to explore some of these issues more fully, both here on the, on the dais and also with respect to the applicant. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> Any other comments? Uh, I will... I think that my concern about your 
your idea, uh, Council Member Reese, is that this is the, the these issues of let's just call them density and sprawl and the character of our suburban developments is not going to be unique to this. And we'd be doing this a lot. Um, I think that um, uh, what Mr. Young said, I mean, th this is the comp plan we have. It's going to take a while to get the new comp plan that we want. Uh, but part of the reason it takes a while is because it's a public process and we need to hear from a lot of people and we're, we're even funding outreach to make that comp plan what we want to be, but it's all going to take time. And in, in the meanwhile, we've got kind of racing ahead uh, developers. Uh, and so I guess uh, I am, I'm just going to say I, I'm going to reluctantly support this. Um, and, and, you know, recognizing that it's just a very large example of something that we're dealing with all the time and are continually uh, dealing with. I don't think on this particular piece of property we're likely to get something better um, for the reasons that uh, have been pointed out. Um, I, I'll also just, I just need to say, on a $168 million development, with no, not even a minimal affordable housing proffer. I mean, that's just weak. Um, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I, I know that my ability to, you know, I know that we're not to, uh, we can't legally make our zoning decisions on that basis, and I don't. But I will just tell you, I think that anybody that's building a $168 million development in Durham ought to be making contributions to our affordable housing fund. Anybody that's adding 100 students to our public schools ought to be making contributions. So that's my thought. Mr. Mayor, you're exactly right. I believe that Commissioner uh, Miller um, and I sense reluctantly our planning director have the better of the legal argument about what the what is consistent with the comprehensive plan. But Mr. Mayor, you know better than any of us up here that that's not the decision we have to make tonight. Mm. Just because something is consistent with the comprehensive plan doesn't mean we have to vote for it. Thank you. Our decisions are about what's in the best interest of this city or what, what we're being asked to make part of the city. <laughs> not even part of the city right now. Um, I, I said that the very first development case we talked about from this dais three and a half years ago, and I believe it today. That's frankly neither here nor there as to whether or not this is a good idea, but it's just that's the reality. The, whether or not it's consistent with the comprehensive plan gets you in this door to come and talk to us about it. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's the floor, but I don't think that's the bar that we've got on this, on this council. Um, and I just, no, I did, I'm not, no disrespect, I just want to make sure that folks don't get the impression that that's enough at least earn my vote. Indeed, Mayor. yeah. Um, this is yeah. this is a legislative matter. We get to make the decision that we want. Uh, I, I I I am reluctantly persuaded uh, that given this piece of property and the conditions that exist here, that this is the best thing we're going to get here for some good long while. Uh, but I've been wrong. You may before. not be wrong. <laughs> I've been wrong many times. Yes. Right many times. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I uh, again, I, I everything that's being said up here, uh, I resonate with. I I, I think it's also. In, in, in the best interest of the city that we, we send out a signal that we're going to, to treat folk. Um, if, if the next case like this comes up and we don't have the benefit of such a voluminous opinion from a Commissioner Baker uh, that did, does not factor into the conversation, um, it does in this case, but if it doesn't, um, I'm, I'm concerned about what, what what decision, what, the, the, the deal is to change the comprehensive plan, not, not to, um, no matter what our level of frustration with, with developer for not, and I'm, there's no causal link, but making any proffers, but I think it's important that we, we send out a signal that everybody's playing on the same uh, playground, if you will, and with a level set uh, of, of considerations. Um, I think Mr. Miller, and, and as I said, I think he does have the better of the legal argument, but I, I also, um, you know, there's also an argument to be made that uh, this is what we said, the comprehensive plan says, uh, and, and this is what 
uh, uh, you know, what the, the standard is for now. I, again, this is, this is not a, uh, an enthusiastic vote on my part. Uh, but in, in holding both uh, Commissioner Miller's and Commissioner Baker's statements in tension uh, with one another, uh, I, I'd rather err um, on the side of, 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 if I can say it, fairness and equitable treatment, um, rather than an ad hoc kind of um, uh, appeal to whatever at this particular meeting, and then uh, you know another developer comes along, and I don't want to seem capricious. Uh, when it comes to, to matters like this. Um, and again, that the precedent for making profits is not the logic that was used here tonight. And I, I want you to take that back to our friends at the bank's uh, law firm. Uh, so I'm, I'm with the mayor. I will be hesitantly um, supporting this development. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Councilmember Austin, then Councilmember Freeman. Thanks, yeah, I'll just briefly, um, this is obviously a difficult decision. Um, I want to appreciate Councilmember Middleton's comments, and I will also be uh, very reluctantly voting for this um, this item. Um, kind of just to echo what's already been said, I think you know we will have a lot of very important policy decisions to make uh, as it relates to the uh, revision of our comprehensive plan. And I very much appreciated many of Commissioner Baker's comments, but. Um, you know, this developer and many others that will come before us are acting in good faith um, with the comprehensive plan that we have. And um, yeah, I, yeah I, 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 I'm not excited to do it, but I will we'll, we'll vote for this. this thank you, Council Member. Item. Council Member Freeman. Uh, thank you. I, um, I just want to err on the side of the conversation we've been having around many of the policy areas that we have conversation about and good governance and making sure that we're living into our values as a council, recognizing that I've voted against many a development project in, on this council, um, acknowledging that water, trees, and our sustainability matter more than what our comprehensive plan from 2005 says, recognizing where we are in climate change and how our environment is impacted by future development, because this goes forward. This does not go backwards. This is about seven generations going ahead, and I'm, frustrated that council is still at the point where they're still looking at it as if it's just about the law or just about the legal ramifications. This is more about what we leave for the children of this city as a whole. And I just want to make sure that that's not missed and acknowledging that I will be voting against this because I don't feel like it works for the greater good of this city. Thank you. If I might pose a question, uh, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Um, Council yeah. Freeman, are, are, are you... I take very seriously what you say. Are, is there something about this particular development that you think is going to have undue or deleterious impact on the environment? I mean, I think I, as I as I looked at the landscape of that area, I do I am concer concerned seriously about the intermittent, intermittent streams that are centered in the, those areas. And I understand that the developers offered um, huge buffers, but recognize that buffers are not enough. They're the they're the legal standard that's been created by our general legislator, like. That's just North Carolina. Let's be clear that that's not the, that's not the world. And so just, just noting that, I didn't make my decision based on that, but I do hold that tension in recognizing that it does not serve the purpose of what my principle is in, in forward seven generations. But I do know when I do see a development that does not live into a number of those principles, I cannot support it. And I've held that all the way through. There's not been a case where I haven't looked at that. It's not just based on whether you proffer for affordable housing or students or what have you. It is seriously consistent with how we need to move forward in our development in the city, recognizing that the county is, I mean, we only have but so much county. And if the plan doesn't, is not in place, and we know that it's not in place, and it would protect us from having the type of developments in, that would create a one lane or two lane state road that we can't develop. We can't, I mean, you have Federal Street already. We have Roxborough Road already. We already have those tensions and we already know what it looks like. So yes, the, the South lift station is coming online, but do you wanna pull all of the water to this one development? That's where I'm coming from, like, and recognizing that there's a lot of tension in, in what we make a decision on moving forward, because this is a large, over 30 acre property. This is not a small one acre, two acres that, like we have had in the past. This is a large property. This is a large scale decision. And I just want to make sure that if you're going to create a, a node 
an urban node in this area that it's planned properly. That's all. Thank you. I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is now back before the council. First of all, I don't want to cut off any debate. If there are any other comments that anyone has, Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, so I think I appreciate everyone's comments. Uh, this is a very hard decision. I appreciate uh, all of our commissioners' comments tonight. We've had very thorough comments from several folks. Um, a few, I can't remember, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I can't remember when, but I also voted partly because of the sustainability issues mentioned by Commissioner Baker at another, uh, on another planning zoning matter, and I will be voting no for the same reason. I understand our comp plan is not where we need it to be. I understand that this fits with the design currently, but um, we need to do better, and I expect our developers to do better, and they're not gonna do better if we just accept what they give us. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Middleton? I'm just, I'll just say, I hope we will be consistent with all other developers coming forward, henceforth, from now, under the same parameters of this conversation. I, that's gonna be interesting to watch. Um, so I, I, I hear here to everything that's being said, but you know, if we're gonna lay the gauntlet down that strong, it, it's gonna come back. These, these meetings are recorded and archived, so I would just remind us of everything that's being set up here this evening. So Thank you, thank you. Councilmember. Any other comments? If not, uh, do I hear a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing 1001 Olive Branch Road? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion fails with Council Member Caballero. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, Councilmember Freeman, and Councilmember Reese voting no. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ms. Sonyak, uh, should we, at this point, we, we're, we did not do the annexation. Should we uh, proceed or should we uh, assume at this point we should not? No, there's no need to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now move to item 47, Economic Development Incentive with the famous Chicken Hut, Durham, Inc. We'll now hear from staff. <clears throat> Mayor Shul, members of council, my name is Chris Dickey. I'm with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. For you is an item to consider for approval, a proposed agreement between the city of Durham and the famous Chicken Hut. Chicken Hut is an African-American legacy business that has been in existence for over 60 years. Chicken Hut has applied for an OEW, an Office of Economic Workforce, or Office of Economic and Workforce Development Neighborhood Revitalization Grant. Chicken Hut proposes to repair the roof and parking lot area of the building at 3019 Fayetteville Street, which is located on the city of Durham targeted commercial corridor. The project, when completed, will enable this African-American legacy business to simulate new business development, provide increased opportunities for local residents, and promote curbside appeal for this neighborhood. The proposed project will produce approximately $46,920 in private investment with $27,071 in city funding recommendation, producing approximately 2.1 ratio of private to public funding. The company shall expend a minimum of $47,714 in hard costs to provide the city with evidence of this by completion deadline. In addition, <laughs> which is what more importantly I like about this uh, project here, is that the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and the Small Business Technology Development Center at North Carolina Central University will be partnering with us together to assist this new business owner with the implementation of a, of a successful business succession plan and providing support for the continuing success of this legacy business. Small uh, SPTDC did a detailed assessment of the business and covered several areas in which technical assistance can be provided to assist this successful sustainment of this African-American legacy business. Uh, SBTDs will provide a variety of business consulting technical service, and Latasha Gaddy's here uh, representing STBC if we want to get into the, uh, uh, the details of this. Um, I think as council knows, uh, our office um, has been part of a SEEDS initiative in reference to finding ways where we can help African-American legacy businesses. Although we don't have a, a full detailed plan right now, but this is a prime example of something that we're looking to do, find businesses 
that, uh, that are important to the city of Durham, that have been here for a while, that are going through some challenges. What I didn't tell you here is that uh, the Chicken Hut's been here for 60 years, and unfortunately, uh, Peggy Tapp uh, passed away within the past year here, and what's happening, the son has stepped in as a generational, and he's reached out to us to find out how can we help him sustain, that, sustain this business. And that's my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Dickey. And uh, you've heard the report from staff, and I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open. Uh, and uh, before we have the speakers, I'm going to ask if there are any questions or comments uh, for staff, any questions from members of the council, Mayor Pro Tem, and then Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to ask with regard to the SEEDS program, if the owners of the Chicken Hut are interested in pursuing um, conversion to worker ownership as a possible succession plan? Uh, at this particular moment, they're not. Uh, what they're really just interested in right now is maintaining the business and uh, uh, stabilizing it. Uh, they are interested in the uh, business succession uh, uh, planning of it, because at some point there will be some transfer of wealth, but they're not looking at that on time. I think as a part of the SEEDS program, again, we, without getting into details, because we still have to do the finite details, uh, um, uh, the SEED fellows will be going to D.C. in about two weeks to put a finalized development plan together. But this particular situation right here, they're not looking for employee conversion at this particular time and moment. Thank you. Councilmember Freeman. I just wanted to um, thank the Office of Workforce and Economic Development for bringing forward an actual plan and incentive that represents our values as a city and does live into that shared economic prosperity um, strategy that we're we've been talking about and planning for for the last two years so that I've been involved in. And um, I acknowledge that um, the Chicken Hut's history and the legacy that, that's been developed, and I'd love to find ways to support them even further to make sure that this is a business that thrives in our community. Um, it is one of very few on Federal Street um, near North Carolina Central University that is always full or always, you know, always business going on. And I, I can appreciate that the, with all of the challenges of the businesses around it, that this business has, has made um, a way to survive over the last 60 years. And it's, it speaks volumes to their ability to work. Um, and Ms. Tapp is her name. Thank you, Tapp. Um, I just want to take a moment to, to just thank her and her family for providing this service in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I also have a question. Um, I see that um, apparently there's going to be mystery shoppers as part of these small uh, business centers. Uh, I, I, I volunteer. Analysis, is, is that right? Yes. yes Can I be a mystery shopper <laughs> on Beef Ribs Day? <laughs> and me on fried chicken, any, any, sir. Well, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on the capital improvement side. I would have to get with uh, the Small Business Technology Development Center and right. Mr. Tapp himself to find out. All right, we'll ask Mr. That. Tapp when he gets up there if I can be a mystery shopper, and I bet you there's some other volunteers as well. Um, all righty, we have two people signed up to speak on this. One is Victoria Peterson. I don't see Ms. Peterson here. I think she gave up for the uh, The other is Mr. Claiborne Tapp. Mr. Tapp, welcome. We're really glad to see you. Mr. Tapp, you have three minutes. Um, first, I would like to thank everybody for their time tonight. Um, but my name is Claiborne Tapp, and I'm the sole heir of Peggy Tapp and the current owner of the famous Chicken Hut of Durham. Um, our restaurant was established in the Durham community in 1957 and founded by my father, Claiborne Tapp Jr. We are currently operating at 3019 Fayetteville Street in Durham. My mother, Peggy Tapp, passed on her 78th birthday on um, April 10th of last year, and I have now solely taken over the family business along with my cousin, um, Jeffrey Johnson. My mother was well known for providing meals throughout the community and received a number of awards and recognition of her efforts. As you can imagine, our building is old and is in need of a lot of attention. I'm here seeking your financial support to upgrade our roof and pave our parking lot in order to help with improvements. As I work to improve and grow our business, provide additional job opportunities, 
and a continued place for our community to gather for food, comfort, comfort food, and ultimately continue my mother and father's legacy. Thank you, Mr. Tapp. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item tonight? Mr. Tapp? Yes, sir. Uh, you've got a fabulous business. Thank you, sir. I love the food there. Thank you. I think I've been eating there for almost 40 years, and uh, I love it. Um, and uh, not just eating there, but also meeting there. It's a place where it has a, has a rich history uh, from many, many years uh, from the, well, for me, I'll just say from the late 70s up through the 80s and 90s, uh, we used to have meetings in the back room uh, where uh, the members of the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, the People's Alliance, um, and others used to meet to talk about the future of our city. And uh, it's always been such, a, such an incredible uh, gathering place as well as a great place to eat. Uh, so thank you so much for continuing the legacy. And, thank you. And uh, I want to thank our staff, Chris, for um, bringing this to us. Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you are probably most responsible for the shape I'm in. <laughs> which is essentially round. Um, I want to I want to um, just register my my sheer delight at being able to vote on approving um, this um, this initiative. There are there are a handful of iconic uh, eateries um, in America that are iconic in the African American community because they were there were meeting places. They were hubs for for regular folk and leadership to gather. Um, businesses were launched. I, I think of Pascal's in Atlanta and, and places in Harlem, any number of places, Amy Ruth, Sylvia's in Harlem, uh, places throughout the United States where it was known that if you, uh, if we were in trouble or we needed to plan or we needed to strategize, there were places where we knew we could meet unmolested um, and have a good meal and talk about our people's future. And uh, Chicken Hut has been that place in Durham. Um, for so many luminaries and so many icons and so many, uh, so a lot of businesses got started over the food at your business uh, in our in our city. So I, I just want to thank you and honor uh, your legacy, uh, honor the memory of your mother, who was so many other people's mom. So thank you for sharing her uh, with us, and uh, I look forward to to voting and to support this. Thank you for everything, and we look forward to many many more decades you, of uh, dreams being hatched over your food. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mayor. Any other comments? Uh, Councilmember Alston. I can't let I can't let uh, the moment pass without kind of celebrating you and, and kind of flexing some of my bona fides. Um, so, so my brother, I have an older brother who occupies the first chair at Deluxe Barbershop, okay. not too far from you. And on the other side of Fayetteville Street, the Fishers have been uh, laying my folks to rest for generations. And right in the middle of those two places is, is the Chicken Hut which I've been into and passed, I couldn't even tell you how many times since I was a child. So um, I just wanna you know, kind of echo the celebration and the gratitude that folks on the dais have, have sent your way. And if you need help building that roof, I'll come help do it myself. Well, thank you so much, mm -hmm. appreciate it. Council Member Austin is, makes some awesome ribs. <laughs> <laughs> so if you need anybody to, pop up. to fill in. Uh, okay. And thank you. Thank you. Somebody, if you need an extra, extra hand behind that, Cook line. Okay. All right. I've heard All right. legends about the mac and cheese. Yeah, that's right. Also, so. All righty. I wouldn't Any know other myself. Comments, but. council members. Thank you so much. We are now going to uh, take action on this item. Uh, we'll need a vote to authorize the city manager to execute the economic development incentive agreement. So moved. Second. 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 It's been moved and seconded that we authorize the city manager to execute the economic development incentive agreement with the with famous Chicken Hut Durham Inc. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> Need to have him back. And the motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And I also want to thank you all for hanging with us tonight. I'm thank sorry y'all were at the end of the agenda. It just so happened to be budget hearing night, and we apologize that you had to hang with us, but we're grateful that you did. And I, can I say one more? Yes, of course. Yeah, I would like to thank Mr. Chris Dick and Ms. Latasha for Great. assisting us, and all of you, I appreciate all of y'all. Super. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Chris, thank you. You're welcome.
Uh, uh, there being no other business to come before this meeting, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 10.58. <laughs> <laughs>